it's a new year y'all and for me i've never been one to do resolutions i do solutions and for the past almost two years i've been drinking ag1 every single day thanks to my brother dr andrew huberman who turned me on to this incredible product every day every morning no exceptions just one scoop and a glass of water they also make packs that you can travel with that's been very very helpful for me as a active touring person having these packets with me all around the world has been really really helpful so if you're a musician or somebody that is always on the go the travel packs are incredible ag1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins minerals and pre and probiotics it's a very powerful it's very healthy and it's really simple man healthy aging it shouldn't feel complicated the thought of taking multiple supplements and all these types of vitamins and stuff and powders it's truly exhausting for me I've never been one to take a lot of uh, multivitamins anyway throughout my whole life. I always prided myself in just eating vegetables and eating all the stuff I need naturally, not in a pill form. So this is incredible. It covers my nutrient gaps. It supports my mental and physical health. AG1 is hassle-free, 60 seconds every morning. It's the high-quality ingredients of pre and probiotics, adaptogens and antioxidants, and whole food sourced nutrients. I drink it every single day. Every batch of AG1s goes through rigorous testing processes and their ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. If there's one product I can suggest you guys is the AG1s, man. This has been a life changer for me. So go to ag1.com slash OLLC and you can get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 and K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support, vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients for the day and it's helped my mental and physical. So if there's one thing I can uh, recommend to you guys, it's AG1s. It's my nutritional insurance. I pride myself as almost being 54 years old, not going to the doctor all the time, knock on wood. I've been healthy my whole life and try to strive to be a healthy person, stay young, stay full of energy, and still do the things I love that I did as a kid. That's why I still skateboard, play music, exercise. So start the year off right, AG1, ag1.com slash OLLC. Yo, yo, Liquid Death, thank you so much for hydrating all my guests, taking care of me and my family and my friends. Love your water, love your brand, love what you stand for, love you give back to the community. If you want to learn more about Liquid Death and how it started, listen to episode 115 with the co-founder, owner, and creator of Liquid Death, Mike Cesario. Just a punk rock skateboarding kid from Delaware with a dream. It's an incredible story, incredible journey. So if you go to liquiddeath.com slash Toby, you get free shipping on any items you order from liquiddeath.com. If you want to just get Liquid Death water, go to amazon.com. But for the merchandise and other cool items, exclusive items, go to liquiddeath.com slash Toby and get free shipping. Thank you so much, Liquid Death. Death to plastic, murder your thirst, stay hydrated. You know H2O saves lives. Welcome. <laughs> now I'm recording. Welcome to the One Life for Chance podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Toby Morris. <laughs> and to my right, you can hear me laughing and saying, <laughs> Mr. Derek Green's back on the pod with me. What's Thanks up? What's up? Derek <laughs> Green. <laughs> and then right across from me, this is going to be his part two. The first time I did it was a couple years ago. It was over the phone. I hate doing it over the phone, but we did it. <clears> it was <throat> awesome. Back on the podcast, my brother from another mother, Mr. Matt Henderson. Yeah. yeah. What up? I want to go on record saying we're all wearing glasses, and then we, we met each other, we didn't wear glasses. <laughs> Wow. Yes. They're all Agreed. in our 50s. Agreed. That's insane. Uh, yeah. uh, two of us had called And I'm seeing more people join the crew. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, seeing it. A, seeing a more. <laughs> and uh, me and, me and uh, Matt are a part of the clean colon crew. Yes. Great colonoscopies. Yes. And uh, you inspired me. And Derek's Excellent. up next. next. Yeah, thank you. Just putting that out there. Whatever. I mean, because <laughs> you're a responsible, healthy human. <laughs> and hopefully I inspired you because it was really. Well, I, and, and I we inspire others, right? I yeah. Mean, yes. go. It, it's definitely on my, uh, on my cedar cyanide app. It keeps mm. popping up. Oh, is that right? Yeah. A <laughs> reminder? <laughs> a reminder like, oh, hey, listen, it's that time. Listen, uh, I mean, what colon cancer, right? I mean, that's. Yeah, man. You know, we're uh, I'm 52 years old. Yeah. I am in that demographic God now. God bless. You, you know? don't look 52. No, thank you. Yeah, you're great. That, uh, I'm 52 great next shape. month. You look uh, good too, Thank you. It's crazy getting older, wearing glasses, <laughs> getting colonoscopies. This is a different w- way we think now, you know? Yeah, I can read now. Yeah. <laughs> Before I was just like, I don't need were you, glasses. Were you, were you playing the trombone? That's what I was told. The I trombone would, with the phone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was definitely playing the trombone. <laughs> just like, oh yeah, that's. I think it's the lighting in here. <laughs> were you in denial? Just make a little. Ah, but I already knew that I needed glasses for yeah. some time now. So. I know. I see people I know. They're always like squinting, looking at their phones. I'm like, where's your glasses? Oh, in my pocket. Anyone? Put them on, I mean, man. Primarily for reading, though. 
you know. Well, and that's what I needed them for originally. Okay. But taking them on and off was just, uh, I can't, you know, I got tired of doing that, so I would just keep them on. And then, you know, and I don't, I, I know people have the rumor or the myth that if you wear glasses more, it makes your eyes worse if you don't really I heard that them. too. I don't think it's true, though. The, okay. The last, um, you know, uh, screening I got, the guy talked about, he's like, yeah, it's not exactly the case, but it doesn't okay. matter. All right. The reason why my work. eyes are just starting to get weaker. So right. yours are full time? Full time. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So are they, are they pres- prescription? I mean, they're oh, yeah. bifocals? Uh, uh, they are. No, they're, they're uh, what are they called? Progressive. Pro- progressive. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I can't believe we were talking about it. I love this shit. Well, and yours are progressive too, yeah, right? Uh, now, did you guys, do you guys own or think about contacts? Because... My, my wife, Mindy, she's always like, man, you know, I miss your face. You know, you look great with the glasses, but and every time I take them off, she's like, wow. And <laughs> so it's like, do I, but I don't know. Contact. How about that. the surgery? Too dirty for that. How about the surgery? <sighs> LASIK. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know if we qualify. You have to make, seriously have, right? You have to, ours is just for reading kind of though. Can we yeah. qualify? It only fixes that? one or the other, and I can't remember which one. Oh, really? Okay. I haven't dug. I like to know if I call. It. I would actually do that after not wear glasses ever again. Wow. I don't know. I mean, you've so, worn glasses for a long, long time. time now. All right, yeah. so contacts, no? It's taking them in and out yeah, and shit. It's just like taking your glasses on and off. I hear, horror, not, I don't know if it's horror stories so much, but people falling asleep with them on, and you're not supposed to sleep with them. Right. Really? They dry yes. out. And you take them off every night? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bro. No, I'd rather yes. get the surgery, man. <laughs> well, that, you know. Which you're awake for, I heard, by the way. Yeah. You're awake for that. Yeah. They put needles into your eyes. It's like same day. Yeah, see, I don't oh know. my God, dude. Well, You're out in the day. Yeah, and I had a vasectomy. That's yeah. too much information. No, it's sorry, all good. But, no, it's uh, all good. Uh, and <laughs> I was awake for that. And that, Me too. I felt like I was a part of some science experiment. Like, that just yeah. was not cool, bro. <laughs> It did not go well. I was in pain. Oh, oh really? The guy, As it was and the, guy, and the guy didn't believe me. I'm like, yes, it fucking hurts. I'm telling him. He's oh like, oh my, really? God. But they put an needle in first, right? Numb you? <laughs> yes. Me too. I had that. And then he like, starts really? doing it, and I'm like, <clears throat> he's like, you know, and like, I can tell he's kind of thinking I'm just being like a drama queen right. or something. I'm like, no, bro, this hurts bad. Oh, this and so he had to stop and then hit me again. Uh, yeah, it was just wow. It was, it was bad. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, I um, man. my wife came into the room and she wasn't supposed to, and she was filming. As I laid there on a cold table, <laughs> which I should have brought my own blanket, I should have brought headphones, because they solder it and there's smoke coming off. Yes, and they right. soldered yes. the things together. Okay, yes. Okay. And then I'm looking down. I didn't want to look at my wife's like laughing. And he's like, "You sure you want your wife in there?" I was like, "She's cool." Moon was like laughing, and then I got the little things in a little jar and I kept them. I got to keep them for a little while. Wow. The little tubes. So but yeah, it's weird. Cool. Right? This is what all the young hardcore kids want to hear about. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> We are cool, guys. We are young. We're but hip. I, but I want to say, say one more thing, though. It took me almost a year to be able to be 100% clear of it. I kept what? going back and back to the point where the dude said he was going to have to redo it first time in his 30-year career, mm. and then it finally worked. I hate stuff like but that. But the doctors tell you I, stuff like that. Like, you know what? Out, we might have to. I want to shout him out. His name's Dr. Sachs, and that's a real name. <laughs> That's facts. All my friends went to him. Sachs. I swear to God. <laughs> the facts. Dr. Dr. Sachs. Um, and somehow he's connected. This, his son-in-law, or someone, I'm not going to say his name, is connected in our scene, which was really? totally crazy. Okay. Because I saw Small a picture world. of him in his office when I went in there. I was oh. like, what is it? Yeah, that's my son-in-law or something. Oh, I'm so curious anyway. who it is. Anyway. Anyway. Hi, Matt. Thanks for being here. As people have been uh, listening and noticing H2O the past couple of shows, you've been playing shows with us. Thank Absolutely. you, Absolutely. It's been awesome. We have a show come up this weekend. Yep. Um, great having you playing with us. Uh, when was the last show you played with Eulogy? Well, uh, it was pre-2020 for sure. I can't remember if we did something in the early months of 2020. We, I don't think we did. Um, so I do not remember the last show we played. We, we were able to get that uh, last EP we did out in like the middle of 2020. Okay. And uh, that was... Uh, it's cool. Real proud of it. Uh, I love it. I think it came out great. But playing shows, just, you know, once once the pandemic hit and there was nothing we could do. Yeah. When things started to seem like, well, we could again, everybody kind of just was in their own lane. Yeah. And no one's been able to really sync back up in a way that we used to. Yeah. No, I so, feel you, man. Everybody's doing their own thing, like surviving and making it through. Yeah. And then what was the last tour you do at Madball? The last tour I did with Madball would have been 2016 in Europe for the full tour. 
Yeah, yeah, it was a demonstrate my style uh, anniversary. That's anniversary. right. Yep. Wow. And then here and there, you jump on when they come to LA. Sometimes you play a song or so. Yeah, I mean, yep, that'll yeah. happen for sure. Could you, since you have three boys and a wife, could you go on tour for a long time if you had, if you, depending what the situation was, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've been lucky to do it for like a ten day run. Right? Those yeah, great. The things I can do. Um, you know, thankfully I got a job that uh, you know is the nine to five, but mm-hmm. I get vacation time that gives me chunks of time like that so and you work at home even before the pandemic you always worked at home yeah i'm what they call the telecommuter yeah okay and that's kind of a you know i'm in it so you know everyone's you know doing things from a remote console anyway, anyway. so so nothing changed for you really for work for no the pandemic. no okay. that, that's a good thing. that's amazing right. yeah it's yeah. so always from and and the company's based from minneapolis where you're from they're headquartered in minnesota minneapolis yep. Minneapolis. Minneapolis. I mean, you. I already had a good episode with you about your life, but I mean, we can't touch on Blind Approach in Minneapolis for sure. Did you ever see Blind Approach back in the day, there? Bro, in '89, I was in <laughs> Minneapolis. Were and you? I, oh wow! And How I, do I not know this story? Maybe I, was, I do, okay, and I forgot. Let's get it. I, I I don't know if I told you this, but I was there because in my high school there was a thing that you would have to do. I think it give you like a month or two months where you can do a vocation or you'd have to, okay. you can yeah. leave school and do whatever it was. And I was yep. like, I'm going to be a roadie for a band. And they're like, okay, so we'll see you when you come back. <laughs> so I went to my friend's school up in, uh, he was actually going to Marquette University in uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Or no, no. In, uh, Marquette Marquette's is. Marquette's in, in Michigan. No, Marquette is uh, Milwaukee We're, Milwaukee, area. yes. Yeah. Okay, yep. so yep. yes, it's in Wisconsin. So, Wisconsin. He, he was like, "Hey, let's go to Minneapolis." We had a, his roommate was from there, okay, and we started. We wanted to see some shows. Yep. So I believe you were playing an agnostic then, or no? Nope, I didn't join until '90, and I'd left. I left uh, the Twin Cities to go to Boston to school in '89. So, fuck. Yeah. Where did I, I think s- you saw him? It, it, I don't. Okay, so it, it couldn't because it, it wasn't in First Avenue. I'm, it was definitely. It was not First Avenue. The no, show because it was when you were an agnostic that I saw you play the first time at First Avenue. Oh, oh! I don't know where. What like? What year did you did you did you start jamming with them? I joined them in August of ninety, and mm. and we, we didn't. We played only a, ha- a couple shows in the states before going to Europe. In so maybe it was your band before then. Maybe. I mean, but... Because we, it was at first ab that I saw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so 89 would Did have Did you been, open for Descendants? <laughs> I mean... Wow, it, I've been sick. There, yeah. there, was, there was a period where every, you know, big show... We were the okay, we were the local right. opening band. I mean, that was just how, and that's how I got to know a lot of including everybody. Including for Agnostic Front, so you guys opened for them, right? You know what? Agnostic Front's one of the bands that never came through the Twin Cities what? for some weird reason. Not that's until crazy. I joined. Yeah, and I, wow. oh, not until you joined, right? Yeah, um, that must be cool going back. But to everybody you. else, I mean, Chromags, mm-hmm. the OG War Zone, right? Yeah. Don't forget the Struggle Era. Um, Damn, you know that's how I met Ek. Okay, uh, uh, we go, you know, we go that far back. So Agnostic Front uh, didn't play Minneapolis till you were in the band. Yep. Wow. wow, what was that like a homecoming? That's been crazy. And it was not crazy at all. It was crazy <laughs> in a bad way. Cuz 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 it's 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 hard to to kind of understand it, I think, especially for kids now, but 1990 was not a great time for hardcore. Mm-hmm. It kind of it kind of had peaked and then kind of stalled out. I think a lot of people got older that were part of the 80s generation. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Either That's you know true. And and the industry was starting to change. Grunge yes. was just starting just to come starting. out, yeah. and people were trying to just—I don't know—do something a little different. It seemed like that so, was one voice, right? So yeah, one voice got well. No, uh, ninety was just ninety was before one voice came out. Okay, when when uh, um, yeah. So anyway, there was not a lot of people there. It's crazy. Wow, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Were you, be, were you remember being bummed? Were you bummed at all? Or? I was, yeah. Oh, I was kind of like, you I know, what happened? I this, totally you know, Damn. Two years ago, it would have been slamming. But yeah, uh, it was. And that was a hard time in general for us, you know, Agnostic Front at that time. It's just people were not all that into what was done previously. And we're moving on. Like even like, remember like Social Distortion came out. I remember Social. Yep. And obviously it didn't come out, but they had that. 
kind of second wave and it was a very different social distortion than yes. the old stuff. And, you know, where once I saw guys kind of either, you know, in flights and boots or sneakers, and now they're looking like Fonzie and Lenny and Squiggy. And yeah, shit, I call know? them slower distortion <laughs> at that point. <laughs> right, right. Because it was slower yeah, distortion. Yeah. Um, and pe- pe- so people were I on like their it, rockabilly thing yep. or whatever. Yeah. You know? the, and then, yeah. hey, look, whatever. It's all good. But it just, it was clear to me that kind of the old school was, I don't know, people weren't exactly. I was excited good. when you were in because I, I noticed that the, the, I mean, you're a good player. You know, I was like, all right, Gnostic's got some somebody now that's like really stepping it I up mean, a game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I was like, oh shit! I'll okay. say this: I I I worked hard on it, and right. uh, I was I'm sure I was definitely happy with what we had done. Mm-hmm. But I think um, when it first was released, it became apparent to me that it wasn't exactly what people were looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, and now the like, crossover time. I think. Well, yeah. Again, it was just like. I think of like a lot of different bands as a comparison, right? Do you remember? Um, so Anthrax, yes, they yeah. had that record, White Noise, I think it was. Ooh, yeah, right. And <laughs> the, the, the singer for uh, from um, it's when they got the different singer, John yes. Bush, John Armored Bush. Saint, right? Armored Saint, John Bush, yes. That's not right. knocking it, not Break saying out. anything right. good or bad. I'm just saying that was a very I'm... different Anthrax than what we'd grown up oh, with. I get it. Yeah. Uh, and so the nineties kind of brought in sort of a different thing that people true. felt they had to try to start doing. And a lot of people, you know, as music fans were responding to, but even before was it one voice, Liberty and justice. Yeah, that was before one voice. That was the last, that was the last studio album yeah. with Steve Martin, Lib- which, which was a whole different style with Anthem with Anthem on there. Yeah. But very like six kind of, um, Kind of like nasty punk style, like right. real discharge kind of right. ugly. And what was it before that? Uh, Cause for Alarm. Cause for Alarm. Cause for Alarm, yeah. With Eliminator and all that, sick. That was, dude. So there were even people I remember back then that were like. Tripping. Yeah. They oh, were yeah. tripping. They're like, yo, what the fuck? Well, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, Victim in Pain and for was me like, was that yeah, was. That, absolutely. That was the Agnostic Front record. And it was that perfect sweet spot of. Punk becoming hardcore. Yes, and and you know, I mean, a victim in pain, right. negative approach tied down. I, I, I agree. Uh, right. You know, yes, I and I was still listening to like bands like GBH in those days, but then Minor Threat, uh, you know, Black Flag. Right. I mean, we had that lane of hardcore, and then all of a sudden it's like. Well, wait, we're doing metal now. Yeah, and I yeah. was like, yo, this album's pretty and, interesting. And, well, and I but was there still were people getting, like tripping. They're like, well, I, I was still it. getting. Threats of physical violence from like metalheads back in those days. Really, what? punk rock was still punk rock then. Yeah, you know right. what I mean, I had a mohawk and shit. I I went. Yeah, by that time I was like the charge GBH look, yes. right? Sick. <laughs> and yo, I mean, I used to have. We used to deal with it all the time. I mean, St. Paul's got some really nasty white trash, mm. and they, you know, you know the the meme you see it around. I was I was punk when when it used to be called Hey Faggot. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apologize for term of the using that no, term, no, no, no. but right. that's that's literally the mentality yeah. of them, right? Jeez, I mean, man, come on, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, that's that. Yeah, no, what, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they thought that we were the we were freaks, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I mean, we kind of were. We kind of embraced it. That's why mm-hmm. we did it. And um, of course, yeah, definitely. you know, and it was to challenge the norm, right? right. Um, but point being like, so metalheads were like, I, I still was in the guitar and I grew oh, up yeah. listening to classic rock and then whatever metal would have been out, you know, in the early eighties. So I liked the music, but they were kind of the enemy on some level. And now, right. I'm, now I'm seeing like, Oh, all right. Now I guess we are. And it was really more about metal guys starting to have more respect for for hardcore, wow. totally, I, I agree. And now, it's happening all over, and it makes sense. I mean, yeah. for the two styles of music to come together, and for you know the fans of those different genres to come together, I'm, I'm, I, I think so because that hardcore scene that had such attitude, you yeah. know, behind the lyrics and yes. everything, and it was and, like very believable. And you know, and right, and, and people who had been listening to metal who didn't have that as a part of their music clearly responded to that, right? And right. then so they were able to kind of bring some of that into yeah, their yeah. realm and we were able to bring some of the the power and just hugeness that their music was delivering right yeah yeah uh, would, would dri be the band that bridged that gap a big one for the sure big crossover one, definitely big yeah. one for sure. had so much respect in the punk scene dealing with it was <laughs> one of my <laughs> favorite yeah. records in my bag crashed, crashed out, out. Yeah. it was the ultimate 
It was yeah. such a great album yeah. from uh, yeah, because that's the one I saw. Like literally, the album's called Crossover. Yeah. Suicidal yeah. Tendencies. Oh too, yeah, right. The first true. record. I mean, very true. Guitar solos. Join the Army. It Ooh. just happened so naturally, though. It seemed yeah. like they weren't tr- trying. It was just like something. How oh, will I laugh tomorrow? That record. Oh, so well, weird. so th- <laughs> and so when we were doing one, when we were writing for One Voice, the records I was listening to regularly I liked were one voice. were um, saw that tour. Uh, I love that record too. Uh, Slayer seasons. Season oh. of the Abyss. Which yeah. I, th- I I I know that's kind of a like we talk about Slayer fans. Yeah, Slayer fans are like uh, there's a mixed bag. They don't like there, that right? one. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, okay. Because it because it was a record that was a, to me a little <laughs> bit had brought some groove in. Yes. Right. Brought some kind of I don't know the songs were like they had choruses and shit and okay. I loved it. Yeah. But yeah. it was slamming. I mean to this day I'm like yeah. okay. killed it. Uh, oh, and yeah. uh, Lights Camera Revolution. Woo! Right. I love that album. So those two records, we <laughs> like, would, you can't bring me down in there, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh. So I mean, there was just you know th- those two records were on loops for me when we me were too, writing yeah. uh, one voice and. Uh. I mean, yeah. I mean, if people listen, they know that live in NYC that Revol- uh, Relativity put out Agnostic Front, Grilla Biscuit, Sick of It All, mm-hmm. that, that VHS. Just, uh, that, that was just before one voice. We didn't. We hadn't recorded. Roger yet. just got out. Maybe a long hair. Yep. Yeah. You guys all military down and like synch- <laughs> synchronized, synchronized <laughs> walking back. Which, which to this yeah. day, I got to say, I swear on anything swearable, was never a conscious thing. We just uh, kind of just did it. But yeah. people would tell me, I love the way you guys do that. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And then I look at it like, wow, weird. It was almost marching up and marching down. It was You're sick. Right. Yeah. Do you know that, that so much to the point that um, someone in Europe on the second tour had said that they believed or were told by somebody that w- that agnostic front actually the pattern that they'd make with with our feet as we'd walk oh God, back and forth on the stage comes. was a swastika. Oh my God! What an imagination! God, dude. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Like people, wow. that's kind of the example of people so needing wow. to, Damn. you know, just think those types of thoughts. I'll right? never forget in that yeah. video. <laughs> Stigma looks at us like, bring it out. Like, and I know what I'm talking about. I turn around uh-huh. and this long haired dude, like his shirt tucked into his jeans, comes out with the American flag and he hands it to me. And we hold up the flag and it's me and every from Byron. That's you. I yeah, forgot that, that was I you. And I know it's him. Oh, we hold the flag out really? for the song. Yeah, it's in the video. It's sick. Yeah. I got now, it. Okay. And so Biohazard, that's a, they were that's, there. that's a good example because Biohazard was just starting to really. Put themselves out. Was there. the first album out yet or no? Yes. Yeah. No, I know that. Um, I just said Evan on here. He loves. He gives so much agnostic front, man. Loves and we him. hung out a lot in those early days. I mean, mm-hmm. we we go um, hang out with them at their rehearsal spot. Wow. Uh, and then, um, well, specifically the one time was because Roger sang. Uh, what song did he do the guest so- uh, vocals on? On one of their songs. Live. Yeah. He we okay. did. He did it at Lamore, and you know, I mean, they were. They were, they were badass, bro. Yeah. I mean, for them and there at that time period where they just sort of built their thing up, where it's like, whether you understood what they're trying to do or not, and you'd see them live, it's like it didn't matter because the whole place. I remember there. I know, man. I think when they headlined the Ritz, or maybe they opened for somebody. I don't remember, but it was insane, right? I mean, yeah. when. Re- Payback now, burn. Yeah, the whole place was just. I mean, on that one vibe. You saw him back then too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was insane. It was insane, dude. insane. The no. timing, just like everything about it, the videos, the the energy. I mean, they had the serious bounce. fucking attitude. And you the know? bounce like when too. When you see them, it was just like, oh man, these guys believe in themselves. <laughs> they believe in what they're doing, and I really respect that, you know, more than anything. I mean, you know? absolutely, they just it, absolutely, you know? yeah. Were they playing shows during that that, that video that I'm talking about live in '91? They were because we, we had we had. We had already kind of gone through. They did um, a tour with. Uh, they were opening for Mucky Pup. Yeah, I used yeah, to see Mucky the posters. Pup. That's right. All through Europe, and then uh, we wound up playing uh, a string of shows with them in the Northeast. It was Wrecking Crew, yeah, uh, Boston, yeah. And I knew Wrecking Crew, but because um, I lived, remember, I went to school in Boston. So mm-hmm. I and and actually, Wrecking Crew in the in the late eighties had toured in Minneapolis or, you know, the U S and their van broke down in Minneapolis. So they wound up staying with a friend of mine for like about a week. Got you. So I got to know him. Right. But the singer, his name was Glenn. So I knew these guys, 
Um, but then when I heard we were playing shows with them in the Northeast, I was like, oh, cool, Wrecking Crew. And But the singer was Nathan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Elton. Nathan. Okay, Nathan Elton, that's right. right. And so that's when I first met him. Yeah. Um, but it was cool. Wrecking Crew, Biohazard, and Agnostic Front. Wow. I didn't realize Nathan sang in there. That's crazy. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And and actually, we were out to dinner, uh, I don't know, not too long ago. And uh, we were talking about um, uh, the airplane hangar, the uh, uh, Allentown. Airport Music Hall. Yes. Allentown. That's Allentown. A lot of skids. A lot of riots. A lot, lot of fights. It was, it was Agnostic crazy. Front. I'm going to try to remember the, the bill. <laughs> Agnostic Front, Sheer Terror, Woo. Wrecking Crew, <laughs> Life of Agony when oh, they were just nice. starting Dude. to do their thing. Vision. Oh, nice. And uh, I can't remember. That's but, a sick lineup. But, that is. Um, and, and Biohazard, I think, because Biohazard was there. Okay. They were definitely there. That and was we, one of those infamous riots that happened there, right? Agnostic Front didn't even play because, yeah, the, the, the whole place like erupted. completely erupted before. But I remember being watching on the side of the stage, and the first band I really paid attention to was Vision. And um, I didn't know the guys real well, but the bass player, do, do you know him at all? I don't. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of a bigger guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jacked, <laughs> big dude, right? Looked like he could take care of himself. He didn't look intimidated on stage, no. but he's on stage, and they were just harassing the shit out of the band. I mean, he was getting spit on his face and wow, everything, and it was like, dude. And and in between songs, literally, like I had to be at least a hundred doing the see, you know, the yeah, arm man. salute. And it was e- it was either it was not it was either there. fuck New York, yeah. fuck New York, or fuck DMS. Fuck DMS. Or so, also they said fuck Jew York before it's probably. Wow. But but wow. So yeah, I'm man. like, okay, I, I knew that there was this thing DMS, but clearly these guys had like an old beef. This is a rivalry <laughs> almost, right? Um Jeez. and uh fuck. at one point we're backstage and it's like, okay, this is gonna get we know what's coming here. Yeah. And uh <laughs> let's just say uh there was some of us who happened to bring things just yeah, for yeah. this type of situation, and yeah. stuff was laid out on the table, and we were all able to, to pick. pick and choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a conversation that Nathan and I had. Wow. Because <laughs> the same thing happened with Sick of It All Biohazard <clears throat> later on, too. Yes. Yep. Yep. I remember Pete Sick of It All jumped in the crowd with a mic stand. It just went off because people were just harassing. You know what I mean? Or oh, the 91 tour, Separatora Sick of right. We went to the same place. And Richie Cipriano was filming the whole entire tour, documenting it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And as he's filming the line, handing out We Stand Loan stickers, he, he'd see people with swazis and people start sick high on the camera. He's like, whoa, whoa. And he goes inside. He's like, dude, there's like young kids out here sick highing my fucking camera. And like, oh, shit. And as soon as he found that out, and then once the show started, the, the energy was just bad, man. Right, right. And so dudes were spitting and doing the same thing, and Pete just took his thing off. Everybody jumped in the crowd. Yeah. yeah. I think Minus was, I'm going to say names. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> there was a bunch of friends there. There was people there with us. Really, right. He's like, was there a bunch right. of us? It was a well, big thing. I yeah. mean, in those days, that was, that was the most extreme example of shit that we pretty much had seen regularly. I mean, you yeah. knew. There, yeah. there were scenes out there where you knew. And look at I was an agnostic front, man. We were a... We were what was known as a skinhead band. Yeah. yeah. And it's a, it's a weird thing because it drew that in places like Detroit where oof. I saw it. And I was from Cleveland that we didn't have that shit happening in the Cleveland scene. But we go to Detroit to see shows. Yeah. Or and I remember either at Blondie's was the one place and the other place was called uh, Sep- uh, St. Hall. Andrews Hall. St. Andrews Hall. Yes. Yeah, OK. Classic, so yeah. I saw Agnostic at. And the show. At, 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 Blondies, and it was in a neighborhood that was all black. You know, it was like hardcore neighborhood. Right. So those dudes, those skinheads would be like driving in their cars, like <laughs> in the parking. I was like, these fucking posers. I mean, you know, I, terrified. I know, and the one thing about Airport Music Hall, all the security were black dudes. Right. And the skinheads wouldn't fuck with them yes, at all. They only right. fuck with the bands. Yeah. Well, and I, was, <laughs> and I was assumed that, that, that these people were like, they live in Allentown, yeah. but I guess they were um, coming from somewhere like uh, uh, Atlantic City. Mm. Okay, uh, so for some reason, you know why I don't know, but Atlantic City had this really nasty white power skinhead thing. Yeah, but also in like Pittsburgh, there were places like Electric Banana. <laughs> so, <stuff> like that. <laughs> I got, so Pittsburgh, right? When we were, this was would have been ninety eight, maybe ninety seven. I can't remember, but we were on. It was Madball, Madball. 
Scarhead, Hatebreed, Bro. Earth Crisis. <laughs> Jesus. Right? Oh, Earth Crisis. And so, so we were, we'd already done the Milwaukee Metal Fest. The Milwaukee Metal oh, Fest, yes. Milwaukee's crazy. got some of that, yeah. right? Super yeah. suspect. Uh, and then I know. <laughs> Super suspect. Yeah, very suspect. But then, um, so we do these shows, and we didn't really see much of this drama on the bigger shows when right. we were together, but our, our uh, booking agent at the time had us play like kind of one-offs in between on like days off. So we went to Harrisburg. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the... Uh, I know that name. Harrisburg, yeah. uh, Pennsylvania, yeah. right? And it's a, so it's now a Madball headlining show, just a one single thing. And What year would that be? 90s, I think 97. Okay. Right? And so we had to rent a, rent a U-Haul because we had to take equipment. We were using the bus because we, we were all... It was a package tour. Yeah. But we did this one-off show right. in Harrisburg. And uh, I'm already like, I'm like, yeah. man, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't know why, but I don't want to do it. Get a feeling. We get there and it was this little ass club and you, you, you had to like use like a, a dumb waiter type elevator to bring the gear up. But mm-hmm. you'd walk up on these like uh, fire escape type stairs up the back. And then we get there and it's just, I don't know. I don't know who's going to be there. I don't know nothing about this town or the scene. And I'm asking the guy who's at the club. I'm like, so, uh, you know, how's it been lately? What's going on? He's like, oh, pretty good. You know, um, it was Hitler's birthday last night. So all the Harrisburg skins were here. And, you know, it was a good time. And I'm like, oh, my nah, God, get the fuck oh, out of here. Man. So I, I called oh uh, God, I God. called our it was uh, Scott Koenig was our manager. Oh, the time. Scott. Scott wow. Koenig. And the guy that worked with him, his name was Brian. I called him. I said, listen, we're packing our shit and we're going because by uh, that tour, that was, that was a tour I quit, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, my patients were a little thin. I was a little uh, afraid at that point. I was like, yo. Yeah. I, I felt, because we literally were up in this little container that you could only, there's only one way out down this. I just, yeah. I didn't want to, it just seemed tactically like a bad, mm-hmm. wasn't a good strategic thing to do, yeah, to you sit fe- there. You felt it, yeah. You know, and just wait for the. Right. So you guys bounced? Yeah, we didn't play. Fucking Ooh. packed our shit up. <laughs> like, fuck this, and don't wow. and do not book any more shows for us one offs. It's just, it right. doesn't. It's not worth the time. And especially on Hitler's birthday. <laughs> well, right, Ever. right, yeah. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. It's so crazy. <laughs> you know, what else? Oh, were you, is it true? Were you, were you with Agnostic Front, or is it a true story where skinheads came to see Agnostic Front play and they locked the doors and told them what to play as long as they could play? It was like all a bunch of skins. Is that a true story? Is that like a urban legend myth? That sounds horrible. That they came, locked it, and like kind of ran shit. I never what? heard. Okay. I never heard that exactly, but there were times where you knew. Show. Wow. There were ter- there were times, unfortunately, where you knew whose house you were in. Right. Yeah. And, and it wasn't Run's house. <laughs> right. And <laughs> and you not know, Run's house. look at and and in those earlier <laughs> days too, it wasn't always <laughs> real clear. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, because skinheads, right? And you had. You had anything from communist skinheads yeah. to sharp to pro American skinheads, but not racist. Right. And then, you know, you'd hear talk about, okay, well, I'm not white power, but I'm white pride. And, you know, so I just, you know, I'm just pride of my, you know, proud of my but then people. Then they had the sharp skins. Well, but there were sharps yeah, yeah, always, sharp. right? right? But, mm-hmm. you know, again, even with that, sharps could be like very, you know, pro American. Yeah. Uh, and that would. But that would challenge other people who are more on the left, but still skins. Crazy, right? Dude. And so, I remember. But yeah. then, and it always, and then you'd have these people say, you know, no politics, just you know, skins unite, which is right. a nice thought. But mm-hmm. come on, when you're talking about white power, that there there can be no gray area there, right? right? I mean, mm-hmm. that shit should not, cannot be tolerated. Yeah. But in that skinhead scene, man, you. There was clearly that faction. That's crazy because. And then if you go to, if you go to a certain small ass hick town, you might find out before you realize it that that's the predominant crew of skins. And yeah. now it's like, well, Damn. we're gonna we're gonna all sit here and say, okay, we are skinheads. Let's leave the conversation there. Mm. No more talk. We're gonna play our sh- our set and. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you ever consider yourself a skinhead back then? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Were you boots embraced up and shit back then? Well, I was more like what they call the sneaker skin. Yeah, right? I like that too. Uh, but that was the New York thing. That's a New York thing. That I was the that. New York Joe thing. Bruno, all these dudes were sneakers. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that, to That's me, like, interesting, that yeah. was, you know, so skinhead clearly to me, well, it can't be racist. How, mm-hmm. why, how can you say skinheads are, you know, if you're a skinhead, you are racist. There's no debate there. When I, I was so familiar with that New York scene, right? Totally. Um, and that was my, that's what, that's, you know, that was my reference. Yeah. Um, but you know, sneaker you, skins, you know, back, you know, skins. if you went to like Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, that got right. a little dicey. It's crazy because right. Roger's Latino. And it's, it's well, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, he'd even say it at this show, like in Detroit. I remember Absolutely. Freddie well, came up and look saying. Look, from day one, yeah, United and Strong, kid. Blacks yeah. and Whites, well, United I, I, and Strong, I was, Punks and Skins. I didn't understand. I was like, why are these motherfuckers here? And then Roger's like, yo, I'm fucking Cuban because they were sea kiling and shit. And then they were, they were just so ignorant. They just had no fucking clue. You know, no matter what you could say, they just didn't get it. But we had this, and so we had one of those kind of tense shows in Dallas, and I remember being outside afterwards, and actually, um, so, you know, I grew up in St. Paul. St. Paul happens to be the birthplace of the largest, most popular white power skinhead band from America. Bound really? For, bound for Glory. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, know I know that. that. I know that. So, know that. so I knew... A couple of those guys before that was the thing. Gotcha. Right. Um, and then I knew that that was the direction they had gone. And then when we were in Texas, um, there was a guy who was friends with all those guys is what I was hearing. And I remember being outside after the show and just kind of standing around. And one guy was like, yo, so who's the kid from Minneapolis? I'm like, it's me, you know, and it's like, all right. And, you know, there was nothing said after that, <laughs> but it's like. It's like we both we both know who we are and where we stand. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But this other guy came up and he was like, uh, he was like, "Yo, man, I, you know, I really, really like, I, I love your band, and and you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking, and and uh, this all this shit, it's, it's fucked up. You know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to, mm. you know, get wrapped up, and you know, it just brings trouble and violence to me and my 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 people and." Um, and by his people, he meant like his family and his yeah, friends, yeah, right? Yeah. And and uh, the point I'm trying to get at is, if you're able to sit and give people a chance to communicate, you might find that they're stuck in their situation because they didn't know any better, mm-hmm. or they didn't realize that you know they were actually around like maybe ignorant people. And once yeah. they get exposure and a little acceptance from people who got a different way of thinking, yeah, you can bring those people in. Totally, and, definitely, and I'd like to think. And that, if they read lyrics once in a while, the pants. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, no shit, yeah, like, no, no shit. shit. Right, right. Do you know what I mean? Though it's like no, but you're right. I, yeah. I, I definitely had that feeling a lot of the times back in the day that if you had that conversation, you know, with some of those people, that you could communicate. You know, like get some type of understanding or reasoning, and slowly break some. Well. B- you know, like part of the thing that I think some of these some of these kids identified with was just the pure rebelliousness. Absolutely, yes. right. And whether you're re- you're rebelling by spiking your hair, or rebelling mm-hmm. by shaving your head, or rebelling by you know piercing your whole face, or whatever the fuck it is. Right. On some level, we all got that sense of I want to rebel and just kind of you know say it loud and proud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So on some level, we all are kind of the same when we're in that scene, but people chose different flavors of it. Well, my thought was, let's let's try to connect on where we are the same, but help each other, you know, move in a more positive direction than not. Yeah, absolutely. That was sort of, you know, where I saw it. A hundred percent. I'm sure seven seconds had fights during when they played Walk Together, Rock Together. It's like one of the biggest <laughs> uni- unity songs ever written. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kevin always talked about that too. Like, why are you guys fighting during this song? <laughs> Have you read the lyrics of this right. whole album? Right, right. Because it is a soundtrack right. for violence. I mean, Sip had a song called that too. Yeah. It's, it's just the energy for violence. <laughs> like, just go to the shows because it's aggressive. You can go in there. You can get away with, like, slap, punch. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, well, yeah. I mean, right. And there, again, I and I saw it too, right? There was a time where, you had to come together and be prepared to get violent if you were, because there was people that were going to come who were preparing to get violent. Yeah. And I'm talking yeah. about the skinheads, you know? Yeah. So I don't Nothing know if you guys saw the, that documentary on the Baldies in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. No. no. Is it so new? The, 
Uh, it came out not too long ago. Oh, I know shit. the guy who put okay. it together. Okay. I, I'll get you the link for. It. I think it was on um, PBS actually. Okay. Um, it's legit. The Baldies, so, the Baldies are named after the Wonders. I think that's where they okay, took okay, the name the from. Okay, but yeah. to me, they were my friends. They were the Minneapolis skinhead crew. Okay. Mm -hmm. That um, to me, they were like all the New York guys, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. Multiracial mm -hmm. city kids. Yeah. Right, and that's how I grew up. That's Secret skins. Th yeah. City kids that were of. You know, a wide ethnic 100%. representation. That's how I've always lived. And I've always grown up. And so this white power thing that obviously ain't me. I don't got no, no time for that. Yeah. And now I'm realizing that, you know, that there's this group of kids that are banding together to make sure that those fools don't have any juice. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Baldies and, you know, I mean, uh, soldiers. I mean, so there's a doc on them, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So was it was it hard to like? But, was, well, sorry. The the point I wanted to make though is so that violence served a purpose. Then you start to see it where it's like, well, this all this rebellious and this kind of urge for violence started to get misdirected a little bit. Absolutely. Didn't have anywhere to go other than kind of at each other. Right. Yeah. We've seen that a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Oh yeah. So was it hard to like? No pun intended. You had that stigma about agnostic front. <laughs> Of having, uh, it could have been a skinhead band. You could have been a patriotic band. You could have been because you had, you know, liberty and justice with America. You know right. what I'm saying? Like all that. So, people always thought it was a certain thing, right? Yeah, people. Yeah, people confused it. People, yeah, people wanted it to be what they wanted it to be, but it wasn't that. Yeah. Right, right. You know, and again, it's kind of like, well, on some stupid level, it's like, all right, you seem like you're a fan of our band. Yeah. Uh, but you you're confused and you're you're not quite understanding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so instead of trying to say let's turn you know let's let's perceive that person as an enemy right out of the gate. Let's see if we can work with this a little bit. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? What's your name? Where are you from? Right. You know. Let's see if we can. It turns out we're here we're here together at this fun club tonight, right? Let's figure this mm -hmm. out, right? I mean, maybe we will be coming to blows. Maybe there will be a big problem, or maybe we can all agree. Let's we're gonna we're just gonna figure out another way to deal with this you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah but it wasn't like the every single night for you guys no no, no. but it um <laughs> 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 uh, there, there was a lot of it right. yeah it, that it, must it, have been stressful too yeah it was stressful yeah. yeah yeah and were you ever like a party guy back then or anything like that were you always kind of yeah i was i mean I, <laughs> I you know i grew up with um you know sort of the I, well, my parents were of the hippie culture. Oh, yeah. So, you know, smoking grass. Were they drinking. born in, in, in Minneapolis? They're actually from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. And I was born in Madison. Oh. And then moved wow. to St. Paul when I was like seven or eight. Okay. Yeah. You're like the only Midwest friend I have that like came to New York and like became part of that scene unless you know somebody else. Like everybody usually came from like Massachusetts or Rhode Island or DC or but Midwest was, there wasn't many dudes yeah. I know from Midwest who came out and, and made something and, and became you know you joined Agnostic Front dude it's like a band you grew up loving yeah and yeah. you're from the Midwest and then yeah mm -hmm. then you go on Madball and you're part of the scene well and, I, and I'm trying to think I, I don't think I know anyone I really from know the anybody. Midwest either okay. that wound up being All in New York I mean you would think Chicago but I'm saying you're from fucking Madison Wisconsin yeah bro. yeah it's so crazy though yeah um, and then you wrote some of the most amazing fucking bangers in hardcore, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. So, 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 uh, there was no doubt about it. New York hardcore was a huge inspiration on me when I first really got the, the memo, right? I mean, I knew yeah. agnostic front was from New York and I knew that there was a New York scene as there was where I lived yeah. and as there was in San Francisco or Cleveland or, right. You know, Cleveland or Baltimore Ooh, or, or right. whatever the case. And, you know, those back in the days when I was reading Maximum Rock and Roll. Hell yeah. Right? The, the scene reports. Yeah, the scene yeah, reports. Literally. Right? Yeah. But I, I didn't think of New York as being anything other than just a scene for New York as the scene was for our, all of our, you know, yeah. everybody else. But then you started to, you know, then I got exposure to, okay, so it's not just the Gnostic Front, but there's this band called the Cro-Mags. Yeah. And the then, War Zone. And then War Zone and then Underdog and then, yeah. you know, Sick of It All and Gorilla Biscuits and, you know. Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law. Murphy's I Law. mean, yeah. and the list goes on and it's like, this is a good scene. <laughs> Do you remember the first time Blind Approach played New York? 
Yes. Uh, the first time we played New York was uh, opening for Nausea. Damn. Wow. So Roy. we Roy? Uh-huh. <laughs> Roy on drums? No. Jimmy Williams. Oh, shit. Max shit. Penalty. Damn. Jimmy Williams. Wow. Okay. Uh, so we were like the Cro-Mag slash Agnostic Front in Minneapolis. Like okay. We were the skinhead band. Yeah. And then there was this band called Misery who was like our Nausea. Okay. Right? Okay. You know, uh, except they didn't have a girl singer and none of us were married to her. And you weren't right. squatters, yeah. Right, and we weren't squatters. Squatter. Well, uh, the Misery guys, I mean, they were... Okay, okay. I mean, they were... And so they were good friends with Nausea. Gotcha. And so um, it, it, so when we got this, you know, God bless him, my, my friend Chip, who was the singer, this was pre-internet, right? Mm-hmm. This was pre-cell yeah. phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, total DIY. Just reached out, got a way to figure out to get us some shows booked from, you know, from Minneapolis all the way out to, to get to New York and play Sick. CBs. I was like, holy shit. All right. This is 1988. We got a, we got a summer tour here. I just moved there. Damn, that's crazy. And so, um, yeah, it was uh, nausea headlining and we're on stage playing and it, not a lot of people were there. And we, I think we were the first band. Except on. someone was there. Roger. Wow. So it's like, okay, shit, there's Roger, and, you know, we're just going to do our thing. And, you know, not like it wasn't a big thing for me, but at the same time, every single big band that had come through the Twin Cities, my band had opened for. Yeah. And we shared a backstage with. And yeah, yeah, yeah. got to, you know, like I'd already, I'd, I'd hung out with uh, John Harley and Doug Holland mm-hmm. a lot already Damn. by this time. And, uh, you know, just I'd gotten to know some of these guys, right? Yeah. Rabies and, and uh, you know, that, that old guard of the uh, war zone. I mean, just, I knew a lot of New York people at this point, mm-hmm. and now there's Roger. So we play, and he came up to us after we played. And we just started talking. And he said, yeah, you know, I'd heard a lot about you guys. I, I, I thought you guys were great. Um, hey, thank you. You know, and um, it was just, it was cool. Yeah. You know? And then. Uh, He's like, join my band. No, <laughs> well, <laughs> that was before he, he and we talked about it a little bit. He felt he, he was going to have to take a vacation. Oh, oh that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, and then. uh yeah, and then uh, you know, then I went to school, and then when he got out, he wanted to start it back up. And a friend of mine from Minneapolis was living in Staten Island at the house. Okay, and he said it was actually the the singer for that band, uh, Misery, joined Nausea. Okay, okay, wow. he became the second singer. The original guy, Neil, I think his yeah, name I was. Neil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quit. Okay, and my friend Al became the new Neil. That's cool. And so when Roger came out, wanted to start the band up. Steve Martin didn't want to do it. Al was like, "Yo." Remember that band blind approach? The guitar player Matt, he lives in Boston now. You should give him a call and What school did you go to in Boston? I was Berkeley 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 Music. Berkeley. That's right. Damn. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> You're the person I thought about because I just um had Adrian from yeah, No Doubt yeah, yeah, and his, his son's son going to Berkeley going right to now to play really? guitar. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I was like, I know a lot of people that went to that school. It's like the well known music school. It is. Um yeah. I got mixed feelings on Academia now. Well <laughs> the, the world. Uh, it ain't cheap. Right. And and I think Freddie had the best line, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, so you let's say you get your degree, which I did, right? Mm-hmm. And and hey, I got a I got a four year bachelor's degree. Like it's mm-hmm. a legitimate bachelor's degree as you would from any college as you know, from like a fine arts major. Right. Right? But what the fuck do you do with that exactly? Right. right. And so mm. we're talking about like so there was a um what do you call it? The uh the counselors there, the career placement, yes. you know thing at berkeley and uh one of the common things they tell people to look into after you graduate is joining a band on a cruise ship what (laughs) what (laughs) that because they're always hiring and if you want a gig as a performing musician that's where like dreams go to die in a well, yeah, I mean, it's dude. Really so, well but and then freddie and i were talking about this one time and he's like well yeah what the fuck else would you, you know like okay matt well you're graduating okay yeah uh let me look through the role of, oh well i see metallica's hiring uh so you know let's get a resume over to that you know what i mean it's like nah, it's what true. do you do with a fucking music right. degree other than either teach right or like you don't need the degree and i guarantee you the best studios studio musicians right now in la I got a fucking degree from a yeah. college. And you already knew how to play. 
You know what I mean? Like yeah. to me, it was it was a I, the thought was I didn't know what the fuck else I was gonna do with my life anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I I just you know in and those days didn't involve you were just supposed to go to either. Yeah. No, it did not. <laughs> That's the same just shit to, in comedy. The cruise ships. Like I believe, literally exactly. dreams go exactly. to die Jesus there. Christ, that's <laughs> like, or I mean, you know, or I'm like, usually it's sentence. like older comics that are like, oh, hey, look, man. you know, look at, look at, look at, it's fine. You know what? You know, respect anyone yeah, that may I, be no, out there doing that. I know. I shouldn't um, say it that way, but yes, yeah, same, same, same. It's but not. I, it's I, not I what cruise ship stuff. <laughs> well, it's not what any one of us assume was our goal as a as an artist, right? Uh, if that's how you wind up getting away to pay the bills, I'm God not bless, I'm, right. right. Yeah. I'm not yeah. criticizing or judging, but it wasn't an aspiration. Let's put right. it that yeah. way. Got were it. you jamming with anybody in Boston while you were going to school? Bastard. No, I was. I was kind of. So at that point, I thought I wouldn't be playing hardcore anymore. Okay, because okay. I was 19 years old at that time, and I'd been playing it since I was 14, 13, Damn, 13, okay. right? Okay, and I, I I started playing in like. A band when I was like ten years old. Wow! <laughs> right, with just buddies of mine, we learned how to play our instruments together. Instruments together. We, we I think the first song we covered was "Hit Me with Your Best Shot" by Yeah, Benatar. Benatar. I had that. And, and I always, my, our buddy who could sing, he sang it, and I remember always being kind of so pissed cool. off because you know oh, we're gonna fucking sing a chick song, you know? I was like, <laughs> that's a, a banger, you know, and you, you know yeah. you can do it. it. And, and so, uh, you know, but the point was is that I felt like I had I'd played CBs. Yeah, I'd done these things that's like, and you know, I wasn't making any money off it, and we were punk rock. I didn't think we were supposed to try to make money. Yeah, off right. It. So now I got, now I'm thinking, okay, I need to spend a little time focusing on how I'm gonna get myself set up to earn money and earn right. a living. Yeah. Um, were and, there any st other styles you were thinking that you would be interested in playing? I, the 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 plan for me was to just get as good as I could on the guitar, right, and see what S might be able to come from that. But in studio. parallel, studio, studio. Because you can read music. Well, I want to learn how to, you know, I want to uh, be an engineer, oh, recording engineer. Okay, then that's that's a great profession. So it was, a, yeah. but that was hard from a school standpoint. It's called a dual major, mm -hmm. and the performance track, especially at Berkeley, you got to do, you got to spend a lot of time learning kind of complex pieces. Right. The other thing too is, unless you play jazz, right, right. I'm telling you, that's it's, what I was going to ask. It's ask. a rough. It's not easy at yeah. that school, uh, and jazz is not something you can just decide you want to play right no 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 you know i i consider myself proficient as a musician but i'm not a good jazz musician okay and i don't i enjoy it. i i i know i i am a fan of jazz i know I'm, i grew up my father's got a huge record collection um but you know it's not exactly my language you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah so unless you you can speak that language it's kind of rough mm -hmm. and then why guitar for you what was it with the guitar eddie van halen yeah Sick. i started out as a drummer you did, yeah, yeah. You can play drums right now. You can play a beat. Yeah, I can, but wow. I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's funny. It's like mentally, I know I'm, I feel like I'm there, and then I, I sit down. I'm like, wait, what happened to my arms? All right, why am they not doing what I'm thinking I don't know they can do? What to do with my arms? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Bobby, right? Is yes. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh God. So Kiss was the first thing for me yes. that really, you know, put. <laughs> You know, like, Derek you know, loves Kiss. By the I, way. I mean, and before that, I knew who Keith Moon of the Who was, and you know, I mean, I knew what rock and roll drumming was. But at seven years old, Kiss was like superheroes that played, Definitely. you know, heavy music. It's and a perfect just, way of putting it, superheroes. Was, and and you know, I, my I had an uncle who actually went to Berkeley for a little bit. Okay, and he had a drum kit that uh, I first got some, you know, hands exposure to, and it's like, yeah, this is fun. So uh, <laughs> you know, played drums for a while, and I would you know play along the kiss records and and then i wound up meeting the kid at school we're 10 years old he had both a drum kit and an electric guitar a little mm -hmm. cheap bullshit mm -hmm. guitar with a little cheap bullshit amp and he could play these he wrote his own songs and he na had a name like yeah. stupid names like fruit loops and oatmeal and and they were just <laughs> these single string little jams like ding 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 right. ding 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 <laughs> and i get behind the kit you know <laughs> boom boom bat, boom boom bat. and i was like yo we're jamming yeah, like it didn't matter to me how good right. the song was but it's like you know let's jam that's cool and then eventually yeah. uh, so this guy who was our music i went to this school called open school it was like alternative education Sounds type badass. hippie type you know 
uh, origination of philosophy. Freedom is responsibility. We don't grade here. We yeah. evaluate. Wow. Ooh. That sounds like some of the current schools now. <laughs> They're awesome right now. Listen, though. it's the. Yeah. It, for sure. The problem was is that it, it turned into just a dumping ground for the district for all the problem kids that oh, that okay. that got kicked out of every other school. Okay. Throw them there. And that right. was you. And it did, no, my parents would put <laughs> me there see. because they believed in the the vision. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know. Oh, see, I, I had to go there. <laughs> well, but I I knew a lot of you, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You're my people. <laughs> you're my people. I mean, yeah. and literally at, at like 12 years old, I'm standing outside with teachers smoking a cigarette in oh. between classes wow. so wow. it was that type it's, of it's bullshit like it's straight up like that yep. yeah so, so it wasn't like a fame deal. school or anything like that well there were some talented no okay. no it wasn't it okay. wasn't it wasn't as like discipline like no that. Okay. no there was no so, discipline that okay. was the problem all right, all right, right. At Georgia, but because the, the, the school i went to that exact same we weren't allowed to bring backpacks or anything was yours like that well i'm going back to the the early 80s at this point, oh, like late yeah, yeah. 70s, early 80s. Oh, I thought you were like 20 something. Never mind. Yeah. So, I, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. right? I understand why you're saying <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. No backpacks. No. Yeah, okay. We, we, we didn't, we didn't have that problem yet. But like, <laughs> but like the teachers smoking a cigarette, like, yeah, that's well, just what it was. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so wild. It's like the craziest schools. But we had a music teacher. Yeah. And he was a younger guy who played in like local R&B bands. He was a sax player, oh, nice. technically. Oh. Uh, but he could play guitar. And I remember, um, so somebody realized, oh shit, we got a music school, a class. There's a guy, there's a teacher there. And he's go see, saxophone. Go see what's going on. Which saxophone well, he had was a, the instrument of choice? He had an in the electric 80s. guitar, though. Oh. And uh, he played some Led Zeppelin song, uh, and my, I just, it blew my mind. Damn. Like, because now I'm seeing like, somebody in front of me playing an electric guitar, and it sounds kind of like the record. And I'm like, and so I told my friend who was the drummer or who was playing guitar with yeah. me. And I said, yo, go learn some shit from him. He can teach you how to play like real songs. Yeah. And he's like, eh, I don't really want to, you know, and I'm like, fuck it. Give it to me. I'll do it. And I remember, oh. I remember take, taking the, that was when Van Halen, the record first came out and eruption. Right. And I said, God. listen to this. Classic. And this guy who could teach me. All these different songs, like he could he could hear by ear and he could play, give me a dumbed down version of just about any classic rock song that I could kind of play. And he heard Eruption, he's like, that's not a guitar, that's like a synthesizer or something. Wow. Like, oh, wow. I mean, because it, it was that mind blowing at the time. And But yeah, Eddie Van Halen, guitar. That's, that's what took it to the top. Yeah. So um, when Roger gets out of prison, <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sorry, vacation, he, vacation, he reaches out, vacation. he reaches out and says, you want to be in the new line for Agnostic Front, basically. Yeah. And, and, and that meant you on that tour. And that meant quit school. Oh. Just drop everything. Uh it, well, and I didn't actually qu well, you know, I quit, but I was able to finish out the semester I was in. Yeah. But it's like it was a big decision to say, okay, I'm going to get into the mix here. But it was also like, well, what the fuck? You are a musician. You have a chance now to join a band who's on signed to a significant independent was label. Yeah. Was it Relativity? It was, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Um, and he's talking about you know a decent recording budget. We're going to record in, in a, effect records, yeah. You know, in a in a twenty four track pro studio, we're going to go on tour in Europe, and you know we're going to we got to. I mean, you know, it's booking agents. It was it was pro Legit. level type shit. So it's like, this is what you're supposed to do. I think you know. So yeah. that's what I did. Was it hard to choose out of a cruise ship? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I thought about it long and hard. I I still wonder if I made the right decision, but, uh, you know, you can't go back. <laughs> That's a sick move. That's a, that changed everything for you then. I mean, it did, yeah. Um, Damn. Had you been to Europe before? Nope. Wow. No. <laughs> and, you, and they kill it over there, man. Uh, Well, but that... Oh, this the long, <laughs> is this the long crazy tour in the van or yes. something? Yes. So we... Roger decides that um, we should not go with... The other booking agency, which I think was MAD, oh, just okay. starting to get, or whatever whatever else was out there, right. we were going to go with the booking agency that Nausea went with. So this is like squats, very DIY. Yeah. I can imagine. I'm just guessing. 
bro, super squatty. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're talking ABC Europe. ABC Rio's everywhere. Yeah, Europe. Yeah. We're talking Europe, like very committed politically. Oh, yeah. Communist like, affiliated. Like rocks in a bucket by the window yes, to throw it. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Yeah. Mm. But they had their counterparts, right? They had legitimate, like, fascist. Yeah, they had, like, real... You know, so and fuck. and because we were skinhead American, uh, we weren't exactly all that well liked. Were people protesting of, you guys over there? Uh, there was a little bit of that. Wow. Um, and the those they were Italian brothers, and they were um, they were a little wacky, right? And they they weren't organized, and we were late to every show, and we. <laughs> Yo, long ass overnight van rides. We weren't making money. We were sleeping at squats, sleeping in squats. And it was it was not a fun experience. You know, and again, is that 92? 1990. Damn. Yeah, yeah it was when it was it was December of 90. Ooh. Um, and it was just it was intense and it was it was pretty fucked up. It it's a long tour, up. too. Long tour. We got, you know, we got locked up the in wall, Germany. The wall had just had come fights. down in 89. E- yes. So there was like East Germany was. Things were st- yeah. still getting sorted out. Right. Yeah. You guys got arrested and locked up in Germany? Yeah. Yeah. Because, because, because when we were, we, the van that we were traveling in was parked. We come out of like some store that we'd stopped at just in the middle of the day. And uh, there's cops hanging around our van. All right. Well, what's this? And then um, they start asking our tour manager one of the italian guys if uh you know where's the paperwork on this on this vehicle Jesus. and then now we're all stand so so we're all sitting in the van <laughs> right and i don't understand what's being said because it ain't in english and then uh then they uh they look at us they open the sliding door and they ask willie to step out first that's a drummer not so and, and, and so so, so we're, so we're oh, sitting there the and we're looking at him and then all of a sudden uh they put him up against the van. They put his hands behind his back, and they put handcuffs on him. And, and Craig and I look at each other like, "Fuck!" Oh, Craig's there. Oh shit! Oh, Here we go. Craig ahead. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and plus now, Roger. Keep in mind, Roger had already been deported. Right. He already been sent back to the U.S. because he was not a U.S. citizen. He was a, a Cuban Cuban yeah. refugee. So you have right. no singer at this point. Uh, it was our roadie named Mike Shost. Okay. Who oh, had to, who had to fill in. Right, uh, so things, Bruh. so it's already all fucked up, right? <laughs> and now we're gonna, now we're getting handcuffed, and we're gonna spend a day in this German jail. Uh, and also, no one's speaking English. But they were a little bit before speaking English. Now there's, you know, no one's saying shit to me, and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm getting locked up here. But so you're, they put you in handcuffs here, everything. Yeah. We all, like, I'm an American. Yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, what is happening here? <laughs> <laughs> were you tripping out? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you're young as fuck too. So, so then, so then, uh, eventually we just get let out, and I got. Uh, you were twenty, right? You were twenty years old. Twenty years old. When we got out, um, we brought Max over there. We had age. a briefcase. That carried all our cash. Mm. <laughs> briefcase. And now that's gone. gone. The tour manager is asking the German police, where's our briefcase? <laughs> Actually, no, he's saying, hey, um, I got my briefcase, but where are the contents from this briefcase? <laughs> he told us oh, that man. the police took the cash. Mm-hmm. The cash was gone. Wow. Mm. All the tour money. Surprise, all the tour money. Surprise. Now, Bro. years later... I started to think a little differently about who right. may have actually taken that money. No way. Well, dude. I don't know. I can't. I just don't know. But that same night. Wow. So, so we get. Now we're late to the show. Right. As we are all the time. <laughs> and when we get to the show, the promoter, the kids are the kids are leaving because we were that late. Wow. The promoter doesn't want to pay us. And we don't have any fucking money or a singer. <laughs> yeah, it was just like that was the type of shit that went on that Jeez, whole tour. I would I would have lost it, man. It was rough. You can make it through that tour, make it through any tour. Well, and here I am. <laughs> 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 and how much longer did you have the tour without Roger? Like, how many shows did that guy have a to lot. sing? A lot. I mean, <laughs> that was like it was like a um, probably a thirty day trip. Damn, and we wow. were. That was, you know, it was like the first third that he was there for. And then that I was can't it. imagine a 30 day tour in a van right now. I, I mean, oh. it was it was long. It maybe not quite that long, but it was it was multiple weeks and it was long. Man. I remember Freddie used to say that van tours in Europe take years off your life. 
And if you can go on a bus, go on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal, man. It can be brutal. But I remember in 92, like we're talking about like the whole um, squatter fighting yeah, yes. into the fascist. We were, um, is it Leipzig? Leipzig is, yeah, uh, East Coney, Germany. Coney Island? Uh, Coney Island, Coney right? Island, yeah. With the indoor ramps and yeah, shit? Yeah, sick. So, 92, um, after the show, it's a great show. We're sitting in the uh, the venue where the music is on. And, and they had a little compound. Like, they had a couple different um, buildings, right? Yeah, yeah. One where you'd eat, one where people would actually live, I think, and sleep. Um, and then where the venue, where the bands played and the skate skateboarding and all that yeah. shit. Just sitting down, drinking a beer after we just cleaned everything up. Roger comes running and, yo, we got beef, we got beef. Remember those days? Oh, yo, yeah. there's <laughs> beef, there's <laughs> beef. And everyone drops what they're doing and goes running. <laughs> so we go out and this was the first tour with, with MAD, right? Big yeah. ass, Mark. big ass Mark, Mark, MAD Mark. Yeah. With, Gnarly with dude. a With a, um, no. a bandana around his face. The oh. Nazis, they are coming. <laughs> and I was like, yo, this is, you know, here we go. And like... I, Craig and I look around. We start to break up furniture so we can get like a wooden stick in our hands. And wow, dude. I'm like, <laughs> and there's a siren. There's like a, like an air raid siren going on. And I'm like, yo, bro, they like whether I want to believe this is happening or not. These motherfuckers believe it's happening. Yeah. And I'm thinking that it's probably happened before. That's why they got an air raid si oh, yeah. siren. And yeah. Absolutely, Holy Nickel crap. was no joke. He was our booking agent, Mark Nickel. Yeah, no. Oh. When I first went okay. in my hardcore band in '93, yeah, and he was like, oh, "You see this in Kreuzberg? You see all these stones lifted out of the road? We are using this to fight police and Nazis here, and this is no joke, man. Yeah, this is no joke. Yeah, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, is yeah. that who you are right now? <laughs> yeah, I am Arnold, but he was like that. I was with, with, like, with a little tinge of Jamaican, if yeah, I may <laughs> I am, I am Arnold Mann. I am Arnold Mann. Dude, Mark Henry D drove the van when I was with Sigurd on 91 in Europe. Yes. He drove our van. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He drove Crazy. our van on that tour. Okay. Really? And, and that same tour, I remember we're sitting, um, I can't remember who was sitting in the front with him, but I was in the first bench. And uh, early morning, windy and rainy, and all of a sudden, pop! What, what the fuck is, I was, we're all trying to sleep, right? It was still very early in the morning. And I look up, the windshield's totally gone. Oh. And Mark's just like drop, holding the steering wheel and wind and rain <laughs> coming at him. We're on the Autobahn. Like, <laughs> I'm flying. The yes. Wow, he's dude. Flying. And he's just holding it down. I'm like. Yo, he was, he was for real. Man. I mean, his neck was just like yeah. massive, I remember. He's like one of the biggest vegans I know. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, my God. This and he lived that life. You no, know what I mean? He totally. lived that life. He was life. legit. He was I, legit. I remember when. Oh man, he's bigger than you, right, Derek? Yo, he's massive, yeah, much bigger. And he was talking about like he was like, "Yeah, man, we don't tolerate that here." He's like, "We don't tolerate any of that Nazi bullshit here." Oh yeah, and he, and he was like, yeah. "We have this." And there are certain bands who I know in America that he's like, and he was talking about typo negative. Oh, and I remember that. He was that. going off. He was just like, "Yo, we we will send them home in body bags if they come here with this." I was well, you know, wow, I you gotta. Like, Put it in perspective, that is Germany. They have to have zero tolerance for that shit. And Facts. you look, I mean, again, you know, Facts. I think uh, when you talk about an organized racist agenda, <laughs> I think there should be zero tolerance for that. I, I, I agree. Right? And they didn't yeah. understand even the, the hint of it. You know, just well, that's just it. Yeah, that, there, so there was, from the American side, they, were, they they drew lines very yeah, quickly, yes, very quickly. Right. If and there was a hint of it. They're like, we need to squash it out. And, and you know, I, I was just like, wow, okay. You know, where I was talking a little bit before about, okay, maybe we let's. Is there a way to work things out? Is right. there a way where we can work off some commonality to try to get people to be more like us? Mm -hmm. Do away with open that, their minds. Yeah, yeah, open their minds. Right. Do away with that racist hate hate for bullshit yeah. right. that you've somehow aligned yourself with because there's another way yeah right and check it out you know spend a day with me and, and you right. know see how that goes right um, yeah. i agree th there was no that that wasn't an, a concept for them and no. i get it i get you know it because I mean? there are people that that and I, isn't a concept for them right it never will be unfortunately right as much as i want to believe you know like oh this person if they just had that that chance to you know really open their mind or to really experience something other than what they know then they might be able to change but there's so yeah. there's there's a guy i i forget his name but he's from milwaukee mm -hmm. and um 
at the height of the skinhead thing in the late eighties with, uh, in the twin cities, we were the anti-racists and there was, um, you know, Chicago had its kind of deal, but that had kind of already like came and went like that old guard of Chicago Nazis had already gone to jail and shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Milwaukee was popping off. Yeah, it was. And there was this guy, um, who was kind of the lead of that crew. And the, the local news channel did a two part special one on the Minneapolis crew and the anti-racist side, you know, skinheads, right. you know, this was after the, op- <laughs> this was after the Oprah the, the and Oprah the Geraldo, Geraldo thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The so, and it was, was, you know, wild. it was picking up steam across all the U S from like the media standpoint. And so they were doing their own little local version of it. And they talked about us in Minneapolis for one part and they did Milwaukee on the other. And the lead, crew guy i stumbled onto him like i don't know a couple of years ago now totally turned it around wow like he he's he works with with people trying to a you know help in any way he can mm-hmm. stop you know the 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 racist right thing right yeah. um but he and he it's really interesting to hear the guy talk because mm-hmm. uh he uh is some about having like i think some some tattoo on his knuckles and whether it was 1488 or swastikas or whatever right. the fuck it was and he's at a McDonald's and a woman of color was at the on the other side of the counter helping him and he said he'd gone in there routinely right and she just looked at him and one day and she said why why mm-hmm. you know, why why do you have those on Damn. and and he said it just it it just somehow opened up his mind i know i'm probably not doing the story exactly right. justice but something along those lines and now he's very active in an anti-racist way and it's like that's cool man. you know so that when you hear cool. when you hear someone like that yeah can change oh i believe that people can change i just don't believe that everyone will no and they won't and like meaning like there's people that within that movement that can change but the movement will always exist is that what you're trying to say well i'm just trying to say there's certain people that are I don't know why I called it a movement. It, well, I, I think I think there is a legitimate there's movement. Like, people that are like, like the, extremely the hard-headed. You know, the the change has left them. Unfortunately, I agree. You yeah. know, like yeah. it's I I I, mean, I really believe in him. I'm a very positive person. I believe that people. I've seen people change. You know, and I, but I've also seen people that are completely destroyed. You know, like really broken. Yes. You know, or even I mean, I hate using the word like evil. But they're out there. They're there. You they're know, out there. Be, and, 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 right. and here's the other thing, too. Although I may have, again, I don't have a tolerance for racism. No, right. But I, I have a desire to try to bring people together for the right reasons. Right? Yeah, totally. And, 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 but I know plenty of people who... who okay. Good seeing you, brother. Peace, Chappelle. You have any one question for Matt before you go? Anything, Chappelle? Say anything about Matt, boy. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? Why, why, do you, why, do you, why do you do that to me? It's facts. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a big Mad Ball fan. <laughs> you, have, you have any questions for Matt before Aren't you Aren't we all? Uh, <laughs> no, but, well, it, I don't even have a Mad Ball question. Okay. okay. What do you got? GBH. Yeah? That's your band. Uh, at one point, they were absolutely my At band. one point? <laughs> yeah. And then you said something that I thought was interesting. Yeah. Because th- that's... Um, between them and the Foo Fighters, so those are, those are the bands that I've seen the most. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Which catches a lot of people off guard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you said the first time you saw Crow Mags, they were yes. opening for GBH. Correct. And you said they blew GBH out of the water. Hey. I, I gotta, I'm gonna, I'll I'm gonna stay there a little saw that differently. Same show. Cause, 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 cause I'm I, gonna say. It wasn't so much that they blew GBH out of the water, they blew but you. they blew my fucking mind. They blew your mind. They yeah. blew my fucking mind. Okay, that's fair. You know, I mean, GBH, to me... Look at you, look at you, look at you. Know, you GBH was already... <laughs> yeah. You knew who they were, and they did exactly what yeah. you wanted them to do, and, and they were great at it. But yeah. this Cro-Mag thing came, like, brought this whole different new... I mean, they were on fire, bro. They yeah. were on fire. I have to say, if you, put, if you put that lineup together... Today, they'd still blow away GBH. I'm sorry. Chromax is a powerhouse. To well, me, I, me personally. It's night and day, but, dude. But no, but at the time that but that, that happened, thing, GBH yeah. were like 
fucking GBA. Okay, I got you. But, yeah. also, but it was like a also, weird thing. Like they had to say open. that. I was like, to say, to say that, of course, that's right. GBH is older. They're like, they're, I gotta say those, this: those dudes are like they, they were. Old. They were. Oh, at the time, are they a lot older than Chromags? Yes. Okay. Okay. They're, okay, close, they're probably yeah. close. They're probably close okay. to their seventies. Okay. My bad. Okay. Yeah. They're I mean, to the 70s I mean, than they are. Yeah. They so, were. Yeah, they course. were like an earlier generation. Right. Yeah. They. I think they were still what, technically what year punk. Was that? Even. You saw 86. Them? So it was, it was just yeah. that's their prime kind of though. Yeah. They already. They already had been a band for like ten years. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been around for sure. Yeah, they had, they, they for sure. Uh, and they were babies. top of their game. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. But, uh, it, but, but it was a little bit, you know, kind of like, well, we've seen it a lot. We know who they are and what they you do. Know, yeah, and it wasn't exactly fresh and exciting. But, Chrome, but Chrome Mags was saying something new. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, exactly. Like, that's, I mean, that's in fair. your face, man. Oh, the intensity of that, that, that era that. live was just. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, yeah, you see tattoos before, but those dudes looked like, you know, I mean, it was insane, man. <laughs> you know, to me, they were like in the way I described Kiss as being right. superheroes yeah. that played yeah. heavy yeah. music. Chromags to me kind of were the same type of thing. It was yeah, like they man. just looked mean and nasty and they just yeah. killed it. The band was tight. The two guitars were in sync and mm, they were just you could not fuck with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw... Chromags in the 80s. So at, don't hate on GBH. At, at the east side in DC. I saw him at DC at the east side. I was a skin. I was a sneaker skin. I pulled up. First time seeing Chromags with that original lineup at the east side. And all the skins were there. And they came on with this intro. And they played. And Harley's up on top of the amps playing. Yeah. It was fucking scary. Yeah. And that night, somebody had stole John's Age of Coral painted denim vest. He was jacket he was wearing. And he was going. Cr- I saw him searching for it through the crowd. Somebody took it from backstage. I fucking. It was scary, bro. It was, it was so too. intense. My, my, I was fourteen years old. Wow. Year, so for uh, Chromax, and yeah. I was wow. like, I was terrifying. I was thrilled at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Right. I was right. just like watching all this like mayhem on stage. Just like, holy shit. Are they, are like, they a lot or- older? Not much older. I just at the time it seemed like, man, these it's guys are like adults. Like, yeah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, you know, rocking out. Because you were, say you were fourteen. I thought. I thought. I was, John's fifty nine now. And yeah. We're fifty. Oh, fifty two. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, I was okay. sixteen, and when you're sixteen, next to a twenty one year old, yeah, that's five years. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, a like, lot of time. Okay. It just seems like a lot back then. But yeah. at that stage of you know maturity and everything, you know, it's, oh, it's okay. a world that, of difference. Okay, that makes sense. Because I was like, oh, I was like, I thought you guys were all like the same age. Oh no, no. I mean, it's the same thing like Christian is throwing. Cab, they seem like oh, yeah. way up here and so much older than us in the magazines. And now right. you get to know them, and they're only a couple years older. Right. But they seem That's so true. much older because right. they're doing yeah. such cool shit. Oh, yeah. I don't know. yeah. You, know? Exactly. you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Like, okay. So that was like yeah. kind of like the look when you. But, but another GBH story, though, is like so after Chromex came and just like blew everyone's mind away. Not just, I mean, I was like, damn, the, the, yeah. that band opened up for them? Like, and then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Then. It was like, okay, they're, they're back, GBH, and they're like, we have this band called The Accused. They're going to come and open. I remember The Accused from and, Seattle, yeah. right? Yeah. And The Accused. I mean, I guess it's just because I had never seen The Accused, and it was just like they were on fire at that time, and it just blew, blew the They're a great band. <laughs> they're okay. great. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. And but so, I, I will say this about GBH, because I saw them back in 2017 was the last time I saw them. Uh, I tried to see them again, but the, then the pandemic happened. But the last time I saw them, they're not le- necessarily like going crazy right. on stage or anything like that, giving you like a, a wild performance. It's just their songs. People are just hyped at right. like hearing Give me those. Fire, fire. Yeah, people that <laughs> like so like the crowd is going to get yeah. hyped for them regardless now. But you know now they're kind of just like because they're just old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wow. So, GBH, yeah. you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We played. Uh, uh, was it Reading Punk Festival in, in England? England, yeah. Right? 96. And they were on the bill. Wow. And uh, Colin yeah. still was, you know, I thought he was in great shape, good That's form. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Top of the uh, PA on one side mm-hmm. just jumped onto the stage. And it had to have been 15 feet Damn. in those MC boots, you know, with them little ass heels yeah. and shit, you know, and didn't look like he. You know, missed a step. Wow. Yeah. Uh, All right, they're, one they're more quick question Go before ahead, I... Do you, uh, do you know anything about Havoc Records? I, I mean, maybe I'm familiar with it. And I'm just oh, it's not. out of Minneapolis. Never mind. Maybe, that, oh, okay. maybe that's after your... And you brought... Because you brought up Misery. Yeah. I know they're like a... They're a crust. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I... You know, there's... I thought there was a correlation with... 
Havoc Records because the guy that what? runs Havoc, Havoc Records. Oh, is it? Uh, is like a crust punk. So oh, okay. I thought there was like some correlation okay. there. I tried to throw a deep cut. I'm sorry. Nah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> um, yeah, the Minneapolis scene, you know, kept moving after I left. Yeah, that's what, that's so what I was, was gonna say. Yeah, like I was yeah. like, this probably because you moved what year? I 89. missed that part. 90, 89. 89. 80, 89. Yeah. Okay. Chappelle, what's one of your favorite Madball songs? Would I even think from the top if he wrote it or not? Just name one of your favorite Madball songs. Gosh, that's kind of tough. Let's see, let's see if he wrote it. That's kind of tough because I like a lot there. of them. Oh, do I have a favorite? Down by Law. Yeah, Down Law. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Was that you, Matt? That was mine. That idea. was you, yeah? yeah. Damn. Oh, man. That is isn't. Set it off. That's Hoya. Oh, Set it off, Hoya. Shit. Hold it down. Hoya. The Miss Hoya. Hoya. Street Hoya. Hoya. Streets of Hate. Hoya and I used to, well, at least for the first two records anyway, he got the title track of the record and I had the video track. Wow. So Down by Law was mine, um, uh, but he wrote Set It Off. Demonstrate My Style was his, but I wrote Pride. You wrote Pride? You wrote Pride? Yeah. Damn. So, Damn. I mean, the music, right? Freddy's yeah. Freddy, lyrics of Freddy. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, That's yeah, one of my favorite all-time Apple songs, yeah. Pride. Wow. Sure. Wow. So, what about New York City? That's mine. That's uh, just, but Hoya and I kind of did that together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What about CTYC? Uh, Hoya. Okay. What ones did you guys do together, you and Hoya? Damn, all those ones right there, Jeez. but fuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we we both kind of just helped each other, like yeah, yeah. you know, like like usually, like uh, if if the bulk of it came from him and they're his riffs, I might you know, yeah, but what what, what if we flop that around or you know some some yeah, little you, thing like that, and he would do the same with me, and then, yeah, you guys do it. Like I mean, when you were showing, you sent me the videos for uh, demonstrating my style. Yeah, like you guys have very like unique, like. I don't know, just I guess just riffs that I've never like necessarily seen before. I, I you know mean, what I mean? A lot of rhythm, man. A, a lot, a lot well, of rhythm. Rhythm, rhythm it, was key. The rhythm and, and it's like rhythm was like, key. like you said, like a lot of it is like a like a hip hop vibe to it. I mean, you know what I mean? But it's just, I mean, it's in the nineties <laughs> in New York City, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. So like, it, it's there cool that you be. guys were <laughs> true, able to find true. that and put, you know, correlate that into. I mean, was was there like any specific hip hop that you guys would think of, or just like the no. groove of hip hop in general? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. To, to me, at that point in time, like New York City was, you know, it's a culture. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's a culture. It's the it's mm-hmm. the people. It's the city itself. The streets, the music that has come out of energy. There. The energy exactly yeah. comes out of there oh, because wow. of that city. Yeah, and I I ate that up. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, totally. Well, it, it's dope because, like, you know, I grew up here, out here on the West, so like, it's it's, and I don't know too many bands out here on the on the West that necessarily thought of even thought about like hip hop as like being a inspiration to well, the music in a sense of like the way the songs are written and stuff like that. It, you know, like yeah. I mean, I I would say Suicidal is probably more close to that than any other band out here on the Downside. on the West. Who? Downset, downset too. Downset. Oh, downset, down, downset. And then the the thing I always think about with like bands like Black Flag yeah. is like I consider them closer to like some something like NWA mainly because of like the way they were what they were talking about. Okay. Right. You know I mean? From like a yeah. from a rebellious like you guys type. were like actually taking the, the sound of hip hop and making it like I mean, it was, it was, we were all, we were all part of a underground street culture thing. Totally. Right? Okay. And, and hip hop was just a part of that. Right. I mean, Sounds like it remember like, like subconsciously a lot of it. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah, it was, it wasn't let's write right. a record or let's be a band. Oh, that, it kind of just like hip-hop. organically. We all listened to it. We all, yeah. we all loved it. We, you know, remember Mostly like shows, those old that. marquee shows there used to be, mm-hmm. you know, we used to get the hip hop guys there. Like, yeah. There was Wait, that so big what, one what with, with uh, KRS One and Sick, Sick of It All. all. Yep. Heather B on that show. Um, yeah, that was Heather crazy. B. The marquee, wow. yeah. Oh, Heather B would come through? Mm-hmm. <laughs> she performed with Sick of It All and uh, KRS One at the marquee. Heather yeah. B. Yeah, she opened up. I had a flyer. See, yeah, that's, a, that's a different. Like, I don't know. I, I just don't imagine that. Like, yeah. I, it, I don't know. You Maybe you guys know like from the earlier days, but I, I don't know anything of the, of the West. Like when I think about the West side of like, you know, punk and hardcore, like yeah, if, it just kind of seemed hand in hand, like KRS One doing the yeah. intro on yeah. Sick of It All's first album in '89. Blastmaster that KRS one. one spreading the hardcore reality in '89. You suckers! That was Damn. the intro. Yeah, that was That's sick. Insane. All that shit, man. Yeah. Like that was and, just New York everything. Yeah, exactly. To me, yeah, that yeah. that was what New York culture 
was. Because yeah. we, we go to CB's matinee and they go see a hip hop group at the limelight that night, or go to the Palladium where my wife worked, or, yep. or go to yeah. the, the yep. Ritz or go somewhere else. Yep. Lou Sick of it all, his girlfriend worked at the Ritz. She used to take care of us all the time. Every show we could go to didn't matter. So yeah. you could see CB's matinee and go there, or yeah, the culture, the culture seemed to really mesh well. Yeah, like it, there's like that that photo I brought up. Uh, we're mad balls like with the pit bulls and stuff. Yeah, in the alley. Yeah, yeah like in the alleyway. Uh, <laughs> back to set it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. With, uh, like that, I mean, uh, Paulie the bulldog. I mean, <laughs> Paulie. I mean, think about this. Derek Green moves there from Ohio. He's a hardcore kid. He's working at Fat Farm, yeah. a hip hop clothing store, and he's a hardcore kid. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. We I mean, just so in the mix, funny. bro. Yeah. Like, yeah. so crazy. Yeah. It's just the timing, the energy, that era, the '90s. It all meshed together, man. It's yeah. beautiful, man. And also, New York is a city where everything is like on top of each other. You know, yeah. Like yeah. In L.A. and California, things are so spread out that's, and segregated, that's true. almost like a big small right. town, and, and really yeah. segregated in a lot of ways. You have the O.C. You know, you have that vibe there. Yeah, yeah. Then, Venice. I mean, there's places in New York that are like that, but at the same time, people are on top of each other, no matter what. You know, it's, you can't escape. Yeah. Yep. Bumping into different people into different things. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, you completely burnt fried of touring and being music when you were done with Agnostic Front. And like, was it hard to join Madball? Was yeah, that was natural gonna... progression? Kind of the same thing, yeah. Because uh, uh, I mean, remember, Nazi Front broke up. Right. Yes, we broke up because it fucking sucked. Like it was, <laughs> like we weren't making money. Uh, the scene was kind of, you know, the scene yeah. had gone through a lot this of changes. After one voice, right? After the cycle after of one, one voice. voice, which wasn't all that well received in the states and in, in Europe. It was, but it had really good promotion, though. Yeah, but it just wasn't what people were <laughs> right. looking for at that right. time. Now, in hindsight, or you know, today, I people I, love. I know, and I, I'm thank, I'm grateful for it. Appreciate it, but you know, um, so yeah, we broke up, and I went back to finish school. Oh. Yeah. So again, it's like I'm trying to figure out what the fuck I'm gonna do, and and I feel like I put a lot of time and energy into being a hardcore musician. It was yeah. still a passion of mine. I still love the music, but. I had to try to. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll see you both. So who was it that approached you to to be in Madball? Like, how did that go down? Well, so. Th- oh yeah, Max has it. The the last AF tour in Europe. I get it. Real quick. Okay. We we did a uh, a Madball EP just before that on Wreckage Records. Okay. Which was a European label, like a smaller label. Um, and we did it kind of quick and dirty at Don Fury's studio, Love just kind of try to keep it true to the, right. the original Madball form, right? Okay. Uh, which was really that first se- seven inch ball destruction. Just go in and, you know, make it real grimy and kind of quick mm-hmm. and, you know, have this young kid just scream on top of it. Right. And there you go. And, you know, Roger had thought of doing this because on that first tour we were on, a lot of people had the seven inch, the first one, and they're like, you know, it's Freddie here, it's Freddie here. Because remember, like, uh, the Agnostic Front Live at CB's, you know, it's my little brother, Madball. Yeah. Like, you know, it just kind of had a little novelty factor. Oh, yeah, but yeah. also, he, he would come out it was during like, the shows. Exactly. I remember, like, I was like, oh, shit. But it was a hard hit. You know, those songs were hard hitting. Right, you know right. I mean? And so we just said, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's bring that out on the road with right. us. And, uh, and so we did that. Okay. And, the, and then the tour's over, but so so now the band's over. Okay, I'm at Boston in Boston, but these are still all my friends, and we're right. I'm trying to, you know, on the weekends, um, go have some fun with my my buddies. Yeah, and we can do a weekend show here or there, right? Why not? Right, and we're not trying to we're not trying to you know take it seriously and make it our top priority we're gonna play a show because we're having fun great we got some songs why not just do it the opportunity's there and that's all i was looking to make it yeah and then howie abrams howie abrams, who was our wow. who was a and r for us when we did one voice right um how is from roadrunner he was with relativity first that's how okay. i first met right. sick of it all that yeah um now he's at roadrunner right you guys should do a record. It's like fuck. <laughs> they pulled me back in. Yeah, but but um, the reality is, I really liked the band, right? Like, and the thought of being able to, you know, 
put some serious focus into this band and and hoy and i were just starting to become like friends and get to know each other in mm -hmm. a way that is like and i was yeah, you know, like like when he first when he played bass it was because roger was moving to florida roger was technically the bass player for madball oh wow because because it was yeah. it was roger and Vinny mm -hmm. being agnostic front guys turning it into this just weird little offshoot of af with mm -hmm. freddie with their little mm -hmm. brother singing right now roger's not you know part of it we need someone to play bass if we're going to do these weekend gigs oh uh hoya plays bass i didn't know hoya real well but i knew him just you know being yeah. one of the fellas <laughs> seemed like a, a good guy i was like mm -hmm. all right cool um but you know part of me is like fuck i wonder if he can even play right yeah you know what i mean <laughs> um turned out he could right and then turned out beyond that he could write right. some wow. shit it's crazy and man. then when it was awesome. decided we we're gonna do this and i remember uh he called me up one day i'm in boston he's you know in his bedroom in queens <laughs> yo check this out and he puts he plays he was doing the riff or set it off yeah beg it and i i was like I don't even know. I'm not exactly sure I even understand what I'm hearing. Wow. But I've never, and I, I would never write a riff like that, but I I know what's happening right now is right. badass. <laughs> Let's go. Damn. Let's go. I want in. Because who is writing kind of riffs like that? I mean, Hoya always says his biggest inspiration for Mabo is Killing Time. Oh, wow. Really? The Bright Side I album. I love that album. Me and, too. And, and even before that, for him, Raw which deal. which I didn't have, a, right, Raw Deal, Breakdown. Breakdown, right. yeah. Who, who are all part of the same camp, right? I'll burst. And, and for me, it, that was kind of that New York kind of jumpy. Yeah. Bang, kick, a gang, 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 kick, a gang. Yeah. You know, people would just, yeah. you know, sounded like New York. Head, <laughs> head bang to it, head yeah. bop to yeah. it. Yeah. And, and people would, would, you know, but they'd, they'd go hard it's on the dance floor. No. For that groove was something that was really important yeah. in the 90s, especially that influence <laughs> of hip hop of how heavy it was. You know, you wanted to bounce, you know, no matter... In every format of music, you, you, you just did a you just did a killing time that was like dan tick it dan to 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 you know, the, the technicality of it, you know, everything became so much sharper and just like really focused. It yeah. seemed like with Mab. I was and, like, damn. And not like, speaking, tight. not speaking for the other bands. Right. Maybe, maybe Mabo was one of the first New York Harker bands. that was inspired by hip hop as well, because I don't know if the older cats were listening to hip hop mm. as heavy as the Mabo. Definitely guys. not, not, that's not that's the true. older so, guys. So they right. brought a different rhythm. I thought, I think yeah. too. I mean, that's, that's right. A good point. And, yeah. and they were in the streets hanging. They were yeah. all I you mean, Hoy and Freddie yeah. for sure. They, yeah, hundred percent. You know, hip hop fans. I mean, and me too. I loved you know good hip hop. Right. To me, it's like good music is good music. Yeah. Yeah. If I hear a song, and it's like, yo, that's a great song. Yeah. I won't even. I don't even pay attention yeah, yeah, yeah. to the genre. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Right. Totally. Um, and so yeah, and Hoya just had that had has that <laughs> natural. But the live show is that really flavor. What, Threw me for a loop, you know. I had heard everything, and then when I finally was able to see it live, you know, shows at like Wetlands and shit like that. Yo, Freddie, you're like goosebumps thinking yeah. about him. Well, like, amazing, amazing front like, man, amazing front man. Fuck, so this the, is something. Else. Yeah, so then you put the songs, you put the people, <laughs> yep. you pick how they live, you put pick how they write about, and you think how they play it live, and they it can tell they live and it's real. It's just you can feel it. You feel yeah. the energy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like. Yeah. It's the same uh, people on the record they are off stage. You know what I mean? I mean, it to me, what we I wanted the band to do was represent New York hardcore the best way it could be represented, mm -hmm. and not not to say that other people weren't doing that or yeah. couldn't do it, and right. we had to do it. But the sound was but so I'm just good live. Saying, like the, the live set got so tight, you know, which I really loved well, and appreciate that admire mm -hmm. because I was like, fuck, you know, because a lot of times. I was used to the punk style hardcore, and I was like, ah. Which is what I grew up on. Sloppy yeah. and shit, You know, yeah. like, let's not worry about it. And I was like, yeah, I get it. I get the energy. But I got to hear it, like, this different. I was like, whoa, this is this is great. And seeing in Europe, you know, on another level, I was like, oh, my God. It, it's just, 
Yeah. So cool to see. I was so yeah. happy to see that. Like, wow, the evolution. Yeah. I feel it with H2O when you're playing guitar, how Ooh. tight and precise the songs are. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was wondering about that. Style. It's it's interesting <laughs> you say that because um, I, you know, there's no debate that the style of, of rhythm, I can do it, but it's not something that uh, I naturally do when I pick up a guitar. Because we're more loose compared to what you're used to you playing. You are, and I love that, and it, it challenges me because I, I want to play it in a way that's going to, Represent and sound like H2O, right? Yeah. But I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to play it Matt Henderson style. <laughs> oh, fuck that. I, I want to play H2O. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. I want to, I want to play it as the best I can play it to, to make that H2O thing as good as yeah. it can be, you know, for you guys. But that's the big difference too, is that like H2O, we were never a super, super tight band. Right. And we were always about the melodies and this, and this three part harmonies and the fun as opposed to like playing everything perfectly. So then throughout the years, you know, I realized because my brother's been out of the band back and forth, then you have other people come in, we had mitts for a while and other people playing it's, who play way different, but way tighter. Yes, and they tighten yeah. us all up. They're like, they string it together. You know what I mean? Playing with different guitar players throughout the years. Like, damn, these guys are really professional. <laughs> right. You know right. what I mean? Like not saying we're not, no, but no, I'm no, saying no, like, but I get, that's just a different just, focus. Yeah. Different priority. Yeah. 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 You could definitely feel that. And it's so cool. We're like not to blow up a spot, but every time Matt plays with us, I can look at Adam and Adam's looking at Matt like smiling. Right. Like the other day he was playing some leads <laughs> and Adam's looking at him smiling. Adam's like so psyched because he plays everything perfectly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like not saying the other guys didn't, no, but it's no, just a different style. He can hear yeah. everything Matt's playing. Right. You know what I mean? Like well, you don't have I to mean, worry about shit. You're right. It's, it's yeah. good to hear. And I'll say, I, I mean, I, I put effort into playing it right. I don't want to come up and just kind of phone it in or half-ass it or, you know, be like, ah, you know, whatever. Right, it's right. Whatever, it's H2O. I don't need to be good, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and, you know, I've told you plenty of times, um, you know, you guys have been my friends for years. And the first EP, we we played all the time when we'd be on the road. Yeah. We loved it. Um, but after that, I really didn't follow your recordings all that much. Mm -hmm. It just didn't. Do you like the songs? Love them. I fucking <laughs> love them, Thank bro. You, man. I, I like like to play those songs. And I see you have the tattoo, the first design. Yeah. I mean, Toby I... Toby did when we were across yeah. the street. Yeah, you you, you just noticed that now? Just yeah. now? Me, me, you're Matt Henderson. drawing that up? Yeah, Derek witnessed me draw that H2O logo. Oh, that is that right? Yeah. It's a water drop. When I was at Fat Farm. And so <laughs> me, all, all I know, I'm sure other people have it. I hope they do. But me, Matt Henderson, oh, Dan man. Smith all have the exact same one. Wow. Sick. That's sick. But I was drawing that working at Nana yeah, across like, the street. Like, Yo, look what I'm designing here. It's like, oh, I have my God. I paper stickers, stickers for that back then. It, yeah. Awesome. Crazy. Awesome. We had no music, but I had a sticker. Yeah, Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. I was just promoting it before we even had something. I was like, this is going to be it's dope. It's crazy, there. man. It's so crazy, dude. Like, <laughs> then now I'm still in a band almost 26 years, and now Matt has, Matt's playing with us, and Max is playing with us. <laughs> right. And to me, that that's, you know, and that makes it even cooler, right? Because yeah. we're. We're friends. Growing like old the, together. <laughs> well, we are. Um, and number one, thankfully, other people give a fuck still. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, we're not out. I, I don't feel like we're out there as a bunch of old guys trying to go up and prove to everybody how cool we are and still are, even though we're older or whatever the case may and be. We're not, right? And we're not dialing it in either. Like, I love doing it. I look forward to doing it. I pretty much had the same lineup most of my whole career, luckily. Yeah. It's a rotating door with my brother, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Very lucky because that's super important, I feel like. Mm hmm. I think so, right? I mean, when I think of a band, I think of the band, right? It's more than just music. There's a personality behind the band that comes from the the human beings that are in that band. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. You think you always want to play music forever? or Yeah. 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 I, I, I really do enjoy playing music. I mean, that, and that's why I wound up going to Berklee College of Music because I, you know, when I was a teenager, I would spend... Four, six, eight, sometimes ten hours a day playing the guitar. Not mm -hmm. every day, all day like right. that, but I could, I could spend. And that's you know, I tell people that like, hey, I want to learn how to play guitar. Okay, <laughs> go for it. You know what yeah, I mean? Right. You yeah. don't. There's, there's nothing saying you can't. Mm -hmm. Um, and whatever level of fun or proficiency you hit, that's it, right? I mean, it's yeah. you got to kind of treat it as a journey, right? right? I mean, like anything, you know. Um, but the the challenge is. Unless you give yourself that opportunity, and this is, I think, for anything, whether it's playing guitar or, yeah. let's say, surfing or skateboarding, mm -hmm. putting real lengthy out blocks of time into it to kind of 
experience okay this was hard before and all of a sudden oh whoa i just did something i right. couldn't do yeah. yesterday yeah right yeah and it's like now i start to see things click if you don't give yourself that ability and time you're kind of limited in succeeding and as we're older and we got kids and jobs and yeah it's hard to give yourself that time so when i was young i was able to spend that amount of time mm-hmm. but you're still learning though and pushing yourself and I don't push myself as hard, but still learning for sure. Because yeah. um, I don't got the time, right? right That's just right. it. Mm-hmm. Do you listen to any new hardcore? You pay I, attention to it? I, I try. I do. I I'm behind. I've always I've I'll, I'll, I always will be. There was a time where it was probably around 2013. I actually thought about the podcast and was thinking about a couple of subjects that might we might touch on. And let's get it. What do you got? Um, <laughs> well, so like turnstile, right? Yes. So the singer for the eulogy, Sergio Brown Sabbath. Yeah. Right. He, the kid listens to music all the time. He's, he's like your ear to the street. Keeps yes, the loop on new bands. He's yeah. always throwing stuff at yeah. me. Uh, some of it I like, some of it I don't. Some of it I hear, I'm like, well, I don't know if I like it, but I want to understand it more before I decide if I do or I don't. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Totally. Um, and then if I do, sometimes I wind up like, and so that first turnstile record was was an example of that, right? Step to Rhythm, I think it's called, mm-hmm. right? 2013. Um, I was like, do I like this? I, I thought the same thing, <laughs> yeah. too. I you was know? like, hmm. Uh, but undeniably, the the rhythm, the just the songs, I mean, I love this. I, I mean, I love it now for right. sure. Yeah. And it didn't take me long, but it took me a little out of my comfort zone. And, and so... At that point in time, then there was um, there was Turnstile. There was this band, uh, and I think they're still technically around, but I don't think they're very active right now. Uh, is um, Downpressor? Okay, they're I from, remember that name too. They're yeah. from uh, Santa Barbara. Okay, um, and the singer uh, Dan, he was playing bass for Section Hate. Okay, I don't know if he still does. Okay, so again, I'm, I, I fall out of the loop kind of quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Turnstile, Downpressor, um, you know, I remember when Alpha Omega came out with yep. their shit. Um, so I know there's good shit out there, right? Yeah. And I, it's hard for me to keep up, but uh, I love the fact that, I mean, I remember when I first moved out here, 20, 2005, going to the Chain Reaction, and I felt like these are the exact, this is the exact shit that yeah. I was doing when I was 18 in, in the totally. late 80s, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it feels the same to me. I feel home here. Why, why did you come out to California? Uh, what made you? My wife is from Long Beach. Okay. She was living in New York uh, where we met, and then we just decided at some point to, uh, we wanted to start our own family. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And it was either, and so be closer to family right. when we do that, right? And neither one of us really wanted to move to Minnesota. Uh, hell no. <laughs> I see you don't have your accent, so yeah, you're Minnesota, Minnesota. You're more of like a New York accent. It's crazy. I don't, it's yeah. so crazy. Uh, you know, I mean, I know. How I many years were you there for in New York? On and off between New York and Boston, it was like over 15 years. Oh, he was also wow. in Boston, so yeah, yeah Boston too. Yeah. I mean, I, I just had a Uber driver, and he was an, an Indian dude, and he had the sickest accent, and it, and I was like, Is this dude from Canada, or and he was like. I he's like I lived many years in Minneapolis. And I was oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, and his so, accent was like a thick Minneapolis accent. He was like with with an Indian, but he speaking? would switch. He could switch back okay. and forth. He's like, okay. oh, sometimes I can talk like this, but then it wow. was just like he would kick like his normal so, accent. I was like, this is so interesting. So, and I know there's a Minnesota accent, but not everybody has it, right? right. And it, and part of it has to do with where in Minnesota you live. Exactly. Like if you're yeah. right. if you're a little bit outside of the city, and I I mean I was right in the in the city in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. But it's when you get into the more rural type of, you know, even outskirts, you don't have to go too far. <laughs> uh, and you'll hear, oh, hey. wow, really? Oh, neato. Oh, wow. You know? It's great. Right? Um, <laughs> and you're, you're a very hands on dad, too. You have three boys. Yes. Three you're big boys. in the soccer. They're big in the soccer world. Baseball. Baseball. I'm sorry. They were. Yeah, my, we, had, sorry, we, had a good, we had a good run with soccer. I love okay. soccer. I yeah. love it, too. Yeah. Great, great sport for kids. It, like, I was not a jock. I was right. freaking music playing punk rocker. You yeah. know what I mean? No sports, really. Uh, I mean, I, I dabbled here and there, yeah. but um, it just, 
you know, I wasn't a jock, right? And I don't want to say in a negative way for people who I know today, as example, yeah. work hard and, and, and their passion and success comes through sports. God bless you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there was a negative, as there can be with a lot of things. You know, jocks can be dicks, man. Mm, like, absolutely. And, Especially the punk rock skateboarders in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> you know very I mean? competitive. I was a skinny kid. You know, yeah. I just, I didn't have that competitive thing in me yeah and uh i just got turned off by sports um and you know what turns me off more than the kids is the coaches mm, how about the yeah. parents to get and really the parents, crazy on the sidelines right? yeah um uh when i was younger i didn't want to be yelled at by some fucking right. dude with a mustache like get, no it I mean, wasn't just, your dad <laughs> well, right exactly you know um so <laughs> it's like I, it, being yeah. being good at this game is not that important for me to sit here and have you fucking yell at me Right. That was kind of my mentality. Yeah. Uh, but once I got, once I became a parent, uh, you know, the rule in my house has been, doesn't matter what it is, but we got to do something. Yeah. And Stay I want, active. I want my, my children to develop some physical skills. I mean, mm -hmm. mind, body, spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes. To me, you can't fuck with those, with that mix. Right. right. Develop your mind. Right. You know, learn, mm -hmm. embrace the power of thinking and, and trying to be innovative yeah. right? and that tends leads to creativity and, you know, just establishing a direction in life and all these things, uh, spirit connecting with people, right. Mm -hmm. Learning about yourself and how you can connect with people. I mean, mind, body, spirit, and uh, body, right? <laughs> right. I want, you know, why not? I mean, you know, like, like you and I, we, we have like the push up thing when we go yeah. on tour and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like the minimal thing I feel people should do to, our body's got to be functional, man. Yeah, and if you don't, moving. if you don't take care of it and develop it, you're gonna, you know, have a problem. Yes, yeah, so you're outside a lot doing outside things. Bike so, rides, but all then, that yeah. then beyond that, it's like, okay, so if we're gonna do something. What are those activities gonna be? Well, mm -hmm. soccer is a good sport, as is baseball, where you can get into it and start to develop this physical thing as well as learn what teamwork, being team player, yeah, yes. all that is yeah. uh, character in Discipline. terms of. I mean, look. <laughs> It's true. Uh, um, pressure. Yes. You know, to my my middle son Riley, he's a pitcher. Oh wow! And I remember cool. where he would cry on the mound. Damn. Right. And I'm in the I'm in the dugout, and I get it. Right. And you know, he's he's gotten he's he's gotten thicker skin as he's gotten older. But yeah. um, he was a little on the sensitive side when he mm -hmm. was younger, and he was just naturally good at throwing the ball. So that's where we'd put him on the mound, and yeah. um. But sometimes it doesn't go your way. Yeah. And what's important to me and the people I coach with and the things we as coaches try to help the parents of our, you know, uh, players understand is. Yeah. Help your kid work through it. Don't yeah. don't like I don't want to go bail it up, bail him out. Help him learn how to work through it. You know, yeah. there's there's a point where if, if someone's struggling really hard and it's, they're just being dominated and crushed. Yeah. And they're broken. You know, you're not going to then you, you know, you make the decision to pull the plug. Right. But yeah, give the kid a chance. Maybe mm -hmm. he, if, if you're if the kid on that mound can overcome that, he learns something that. Oh, day. yeah. Absolutely. And that's going to help them in life no matter what they do. Totally. My goal is not to make my sons become superstar athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I want them to know how to play a play catch. I want them to know how to use their body and go out and do anything. Right. right. I mean, let's just. No, you know, it's. it's I, I, so I totally important, get it. especially now, like yeah, with what we're going through, everybody especially staying home, now. and they're on the phones and video, yeah. video games, games and, exactly. Yeah. yeah, sports are. It's it's definitely. I remember the whole jock thing, you know, and I was just like, I hate these jocks. <laughs> but then I had like a coach that was, you know, somebody a coach in the school that was like, Hey, I think you would be really good at uh, football. And I think you could play this position, like believing in you Damn. and then getting connected with like a team yeah. and then having that discipline. Yeah. Like I have to be there at this time. This is my yeah. position. You know, my team is relying on you, you know, like getting connected. Yeah. You know, those were the things that I took away from sports. I was like, this is something so unique. You know, and the coaches would be like, look, you're in here sacrificing your days <laughs> where those people are out doing whatever. You're right. in here trying to perfect something. You have heart. 
and you're with the group and you're with the team, yes. you know, and you're and it's like, and then they'd be like, yeah. we're better than all those kids over there. <laughs> they are not, you know, and then we get into this like, kind of like, yeah. they like putting down like, yeah. they're losers. And it's like, you are winners here. You are champions. It's like, yeah. Okay, coach. Yeah. All right. That, that, right. And then yeah. I was like, all right. I get and then I started to be a little resentful. The coach was like, you know what? I don't respect your decision of not, you know, going out for the team this year. You know, you're gonna be like those losers, and it's like, yeah. wow, dang. So you my know? my oldest son aged out. He 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 want like the the baseball league we play for is pretty much known as not being the most competitive. Okay, okay. we are more about family and community and developing okay. as opposed to winning. Right, right. Kill, kill, kill. Yeah, but yeah. you know what? Hey, while we're trying. Let's try Damn, it. Yeah. Let's go for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. it, we kind of get the bad news bears effect going where it's like, <laughs> you know, the, the scrappier team actually beat the champion team. Like, I mean, cool. I've had, I've coached teams that have gone to championship a couple of wow. times. That's um, awesome. And it's, it's a great experience oh, yeah. for, for the kids. Yes. Um, is it hard to coach your kids when they're on the team? You yes. can't uh, treat them differently because you're, question. yeah. I, and, and as coaches, we all kind of go through this. We know it's like, hey, Damn. could you go talk to my son? Because if I talk to him, I'm just <laughs> right. going to fucking lose my mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you don't got to say more than that. Right, and right. then that, you know, your your co-coach will go, Damn. you know, work through it. And plus the kid responds to it differently, yeah. too. I think so, too. Yeah. It's just, oh, great. Here comes dad talking right. his dad stuff again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. the other coach will come and say something. Oh, that makes sense, coach. Yeah, Isn't I've been that saying that for the past <laughs> 10 days now. Right, right. But that's so true that a lot of things come from somebody else besides you to your and, kid. It's crazy. Yeah. And man. that's the thing too, right? As a, as a parent, I want my kid to get some exposure to ha- having to be in a situation of someone telling them what needs to get done and then feeling the pressure of if when they screw it up, say, hey, man, I mm-hmm. thought we agreed you are going to go do this. Why did you not do that? Yeah. As kids typically will be, right? Yeah, right, right. So if I discipline them, Again, it just becomes this dynamic that isn't working as good as someone from the outside says, hey, man, you and I talked about this. We had an agreement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You didn't do it. What's what's the situation here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get them exposed to that type of thing at a younger age mm-hmm. so that they develop the ability to, you know, you, responsibility, accountability. Right. Follow through. And I think what's yeah. amazing also is the whole mind over body where you go through experiences in sports sometimes you're like, your body is like, no, I can't do this. Your mind is like, yeah, you can. And, you yeah. Know, well, that's where the heart comes in. Yes. And that's yeah. something that you can apply to anything you do in life. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And that's what I thought was like, this is so fundamental. At, you know? at, at minimum, I just I just want to figure out a way to give my sons an understanding of they're going to have to fight in life. Right. Yeah. Whether it's figuratively or literally. Right. Um, there's going to be a time Mentally. where they're going to have to dig deep mm-hmm. yeah. and, and deal with a challenge that no one was expecting. Right. And, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean, okay, so let's say it makes you cry. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's Give okay. yourself a chance to go cry, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. right. when things hurt, they hurt. Yeah. yeah. But at some point, you're going to have to still deal with it. Yes. Yeah. So let's deal with it. Yeah. Right. Let's Absolutely. develop, let's develop yeah. the ability to deal, deal with, with it. Yeah. Are they into playing music like you? So that's what I was going to say. My oldest, Tanner, is aged out of Little League. He did make it. Um, I, I give him a lot of credit because he committed to um, uh, putting the work in to get selected for his freshman high school baseball team. Nice. Awesome. And and what you learn well, quickly. Pitcher? No, he, no. he wasn't a pitcher. Okay. Um, what you learn quickly is once you're at high school, it's a different scene, man. Because totally. he was doing it where um, there was this like conditioning program that was part of the leading up to the tryouts, yeah. right? And he'd go every day and he'd do the drills and you know he was he was in the zone is what it seemed like, right? Then tryouts came. All of a sudden, all these kids that were never part of those conditioning sessions at all just came out of nowhere. Damn, and they're travel ball kids, and you know for people who are in the circuit know what I mean when I say that, where it's like. All you do is play that sport. Right. Yeah. Your 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 work. Your you know your kids in private lessons. This is Damn. what's perceived Damn. as a as a chance for a scholarship to college. Some of these kids might be on track for pro. You never know. You but this know. is where that starts. It's all they do, and and we just have never played with that level of intensity. And he wasn't he wasn't that he wasn't at that caliber. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he didn't he didn't have a desire to be right. Mm-hmm. So. He didn't see a lot of action during freshman year play. And then 
I thought we might try for sophomore and I just don't want to do it. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, then we don't do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, cause at this point, if you're going to do it, you've got to commit. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to, it's, it, it'll be a real problem. Yeah. So now he plays guitar. Now he plays guitar. Now he plays guitar. Does, did you teach him or this? He's, I mean, I, I give him some guidance here and there and you know, we, we screw around a little bit, like just kind of loose style. I don't, you know, um, I'm telling you, it's very obvious to me that the kid has something that not everybody has. Wow. He can, he, the way he can learn a song in a day and play strum, his right hand is great. His left hand is doing a lot of things that people take a long time, if at all, to develop. Sick, and I'm not saying he's doing anything super technical and crazy, yeah. but it's just clear to me the kid is just, a, it sounds Natural. like music. Right. Yeah. Where some people are still kind of like, okay, my finger goes yeah. here and I got to pick this string and... It's it's difficult for different people, right? Absolutely, um, it's crazy, man. He's just he's got something, and so now you know. I don't know where we're gonna go with it, but mm-hmm. isn't it crazy how it works? That like, I guess Max did play drums a little early, but he got into sports and all that stuff, skateboarding. And you kind of like, is he gonna kind of do something that I do? And then all of a sudden, your son's older now. He's done playing that, and now I'm gonna try guitar. And he's trying guitar, and he's fucking excellent at it. And he could have been like that the whole time, but he just wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And he didn't, it wasn't, so he played drums first. Okay, okay. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, he doesn't have to have all your help because you're a guitar player. He'll, he'll get some advice from yeah, you, this, but he kind of wants to learn on his right. own, but it's already in yeah. him in a sense, too. Yeah. It's it, interesting. Learn on his own. Now, but now he tells me he wants to take lessons. And okay, that's cool. like, well, I can give him lessons. Right. Yeah. Right. I, know, I know how to teach him. But yeah. again, back to the then coaching then, your own yeah. kid type thing. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, this is crazy because my guitarist, his son was like, ah, I want to play drums. He's like, oh, great. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. but then he naturally got into wanting to play guitar and then asking mm. a few questions. And then, of course, he would be on tour and everything. But then he'd come back and he's like into Zappa and to complete, you know, just yeah. really killing it on his own. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. so incredible, kids, now. They how, but how you it said that hard, he sorry. wants to learn for himself. You know? Yeah. And, and it's really cool that it just, you met him, you know, he just yeah. became like naturally into it. And it's like, oh, Max, come here. We're talking about how like kids get into their own type of music and their own type of drums. Like what inspired you to play drums, Max? Talk in that mic right there. Everyone to say something on this I mic. I don't remember. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was too young. You were too young? I don't remember what it was. I don't talk anymore because you're not on the he's microphone. Just you're a natural, nervous. this kid. Well, it's a natural. So you know what I was thinking about too is um, the other cool thing. So my my boys aren't jocks, but we right. play baseball. Yeah, right. Um, they are really into music right now. Yeah, and they're really we're discussing in, Kanye heavy yeah. earlier. They're really into hip hop. Right <laughs> and they're watching now. the they're Kanye right? doc right now as we yeah. speak. They're really into hip hop, and they turned me on to that Odd Future. Yeah, click, yeah. right. Yeah, um, Tyler the Creator. Tyler the Creator, Earl Sweatshirt. Uh, yeah, uh, Frank Ocean. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. And I mean, they really, really dig all that. And and when I watched the documentary on that, I was like, man, this is a cool little thing here because yeah. it's it's kind of edgy, kind of your yeah. skateboarders, a little crew and stuff. Yeah, it ain't mainstream generic shit. Nah. You know what I but mean? But he won a bunch of, but he was nominated, won a bunch of awards. And I've I'm just learning being that. Him. But mm-hmm. but you know, the thing I really appreciate is my boys are you know they're they're into the art, right? You know what I mean? And they're sneakerheads. <laughs> they are they absolutely are, they? are. yeah man and, it's and, crazy. and they uh your youngest so i know that they um you know they grew up with me loving the music i love and i yeah. listen to in the car with them all the time yeah they used to they used to have their favorite kiss songs they used to have their favorite van halen or black yeah. sabbath or metallica or you know hardcore bands across the board type songs um you know, they don't really listen to that music Max on their either. own. I know. It's um, all shit. Now. And I don't yeah. expect them to. Right. Me either. You can't force them. It could be around them when they're growing up, kind of like a soundtrack that you I listen bet to. As they get older, they're going to come cha- back to it. But when, they're old enough, <laughs> but when they're old enough to change the station or yeah. put their music in, I love that too because yes. then you're learning new stuff. Exactly. When you're young, you're controlling that. I was and controlling it, that. And it keeps me young. Yeah. It gives yeah. me, like, I'm, I'm, I want to learn. And I don't, again, I don't get it all. Right. Yeah. We're not supposed to either. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you talk about new hardcore, right? I'll, I'll, I'll mention a band that, that really made me go, wow. Um, and I, I can't say that I'm a fan because I don't know their music well enough, but I have this respect for them because they're pushing boundaries 
for me that I'd be like, I, I would never imagine that this would be considered a, a hardcore band. Yep. And B that people would actually like it if they're hardcore gonna, I know fans. it's going to be. I'm write it down. Hang on a second. I think I'm. Gonna, I think I'm going to guess this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Write it down. Okay. okay. What is it going to be? And I, I, I might even fuck up the name, but it's uh, show me the body. I don't know. That's not. I wrote down code orange. Oh well, they wow. they're, they're in the same vein. I was vein. thinking that you were. Same, they're in the they're in the That's same vein because they they opened up for us on this territory years ago, right? And then they blew up. They got nominations. Right, and stuff. It was right. super cool. So they're kind of the same thing, right? So, What's their band called? You when you said. Show me the body. I think okay. Show me the body. So, so uh, I saw this video and it looked like they were playing in a th- in a place that kind of reminded me of um, remember the outhouse? Yeah, in Kansas in, City. In, in, oh, right, in, no, in uh, Omaha is what I remember. I thought it was Lawrence, Kansas, the outhouse. You're right, Lawrence, Kansas. Thank you. Yeah, Lawrence, Lawrence Kansas. Kansas. With the sick all like 1989. Like or a little, you know, a little VFW <laughs> Shack type. Shack in, in like joint, fields. Right? Oh, man. It was amazing okay. shows, um, dude. Amazing. And so tight little hole in the wall place. And um, decent crowd, you know, kids looking like they're energetic, you know, people just kind of like piling up onto the stage and, you know, it looks like a hardcore show. Well, first things first, I see this guy behind this, he's got this little podium type stand thing and it looks like a weird little synth thing. Oh, wow. Maybe some type of drum machine, (laughs) 808 type, I don't know, but, and it's just kind of weird techno sounds. And I'm like, okay, you know, we got a little right. intro thing building up, but kids are like, they're dancing, they're, they're, like, <laughs> they're getting ready. They start, yeah, like you know, like it's, it's gonna build Marching up. Watching to the intro. And so I'm watching that. I'm like, okay, what's next? The singer comes out with a banjo strapped around his. I think I might have seen this somewhere. Really? Man. I'm and I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> well, okay, here we go. Right? Um, I might have seen these dudes. And I, I, I don't remember beyond that musically what I, what I believe I heard. But the crowd went crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, and. You know, God bless this, these kids. You know what I mean? Like they are doing what kids should be doing. Now, when I say kids, I don't even know yeah. exactly how old or young they are. Pushing but, boundaries, but they're they're yeah. a generation after me, like yeah. clearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and uh, I, you know, I love it. Yeah, when I was younger, show I thought me, show me the body. I thought hardcore. I, show me the body. I think when I was like a teenager body. and I heard hardcore, I thought it was one type of sound. But then as you start getting in a band and playing in a band and seeing other bands and traveling and hearing other music, you realize that hardcore isn't just a sound. Right. It's not one style of sound. Because I consider hate breed a hardcore band. Excellent. Excellent point. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's Musically, not just one sound. it is not just one sound. You know, yes. for me, yeah, it's, it's lyrically, not. it's what they're talking about, it's how they're living their lives, it's mm-hmm. how you know, they express themselves, it's everything. It's not just the sound. Mm-hmm. So as we get older and we hear like, oh, this man, like people say, Turnstile is a hardcore band. I love them because... You have pop sensibility, you have hip hop, you have hardcore, you have punk, you have melody, you have the groove of Madball in some songs, you have reggae vibes like Bad Brains. It's everything together right. mashed. I definitely had that impression with them and also with, with Refuse when I hadn't heard Woo! them. Yeah. And I was just like, man, this gets me so excited I mean, about music. Be, yeah, and, dude. And just the fact that they're doing, you can feel they're doing what they love, you can feel that it's really authentic very original yep. and very natural to them. And I, I just love how they're reaching out and not afraid to explore like jazz elements and other elements that influence them, which is you can feel part of their personalities in the music, which is what I like about Turnstile. As yeah. Well, well and, and so Turnstile, Turnstile is a great, you know, example too of who I think they've demonstrated and, you know, you their style. <laughs> Yeah, I'm about to do lift it. up this table right now, <laughs> and they set it off. Clearly, yes. they do. Um, they, um, what helps me, the older guy, right, is is I, I got a sense of the fact that they, they have some level of appreciation for the shit I've done and the roots right? and the history of it, yeah. all of it. Yes, yeah. but um, they don't. You know, that's just an understood thing. It's they're but they're still taking it somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. I love Madball. They're my favorite bands, but it wouldn't have any songs that sound like Madball. Right. You right. know what I mean? They inspired right. me in other ways, but not right. our sound particularly. You know what right. I mean? Yep. One more thing about Refuse is that Dennis is like an OG straight edge vegan kid yeah. from the freaking 80s and 90s, which is amazing. You know what I mean? It's awesome to come from that world, you know? Yep. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. Yep. It's crazy how yeah. hardcore is spread to all different generations and ages. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like it's... I think it's so important for like young bands not to be afraid to do what they feel they want to do. Exactly. You know, just like exactly. just do it, and you, you know, for the love of it. You and know, I don't. remember when I was younger and there was sort of the older generation hanging around and they didn't really like 
what we were right, right? yeah you know and it's <laughs> okay. like well dude rod used to make fun of us to listen to hip-hop back then do you know what i'm saying like because i had my blinders on for a second hardcore only punk only right. i listened to hip-hop too but i never thought that you know people i don't know people just knew that you know but I, I love hip hop, but I would never try to rhyme or make a rap song with H2O. I loved and respected so much. Grew up, oh, grew up man, on it. Break dancing. No, you know what I mean? No, it's like, <laughs> no, it's right. but, but it also was like, I, I just love now that I can go see Angel Dust and Justice can play acoustic set of their newest material with mm-hmm. a guitar on. Right. And then in the middle of the set, can take it off and play their older stuff and start fucking moshing right. the crowd stage diving. And he's from Trapped Under Ice, and he does Angel Dust, yep. which is like more poppy and commercial. Yep. I'm not saying it's on the radio, but it's more poppy and melodic and something right. totally acoustic. When I saw that show, I, was, I couldn't believe that the first half was so mellow. The second half, was like, just fuck it, took it off and just went off. It was so beautiful to see that mm. you could be a hardcore kid and love all types of music, which, which I was growing up. And the, and the crowd loves it. They appreciate it. They appreciate mm-hmm. the diver- diversity of your mind, and they're not just going there to mosh. They're right. just going there to do one thing. You know what I mean? Like, and I, and I so think, sick. And I think you know sincerity is what is recognized, right? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. You, know, you know, you're up there because right. this is just right. something you feel and believe, and people pick up on that as opposed to, you know, all right, I'm wearing this costume so today. I, I am a, <laughs> I'm a, me- I'm a hip hop metal guy, and you know, let me. Yeah. You That's know. another thing I want to say, so. clarify now, because people even hit me up the other day. Our song, What Happened in 2008, is exactly about that. Because forever people got it twisted. It's about how music is not just what you wear and how you look. It's inside. It's how you live your life. It's how you, you I don't know how you, how you treat people. It's the community. It's more than that. It's not just a look. Right. It's not just the outside, what you're wearing. You know what I mean? So, Absolutely. Yeah. And you just nailed yeah. it on the head because people always ask me like, how come you wear Nikes? How come with that? Is yeah. that song about that? It's not about that. It wasn't about that. It was never about that. It was about we could actually just look totally normal at one point and walk into Hot Topic and come out looking like Sid Vicious. Right. And, right. Then, you, and, then, you, <laughs> and then you were punk without any, any sort of substance or like lie. I don't know. That, for me, that's what that was song was inspired by. Absolutely. You know like, I mean. No diss to Hot Topic because they've carried well, again, right? merch before. And not, it wasn't well, about but, that. But we, was, were, we were talking about, um, you know, when, when I was a punk rocker in the early days and it was uh it was not mainstream and also yeah. punk rock was mainstream it was to have a mohawk was something you saw as a fun cool new haircut to have for young people that was all over tv right and all in you know in pop culture uh and then it's not it's a different thing at that point right the and, only thing cool yeah. about that probably for that generation or that time is maybe kids got less picked on for looking like a punk when it became more mainstream and it, like, was, it right? was something that was so shocking and so, so those kids could be themselves and not get fucked with by I don't know people. And they sure as fuck don't need me walking around and saying, oh, come on, when I was a kid and I got a <laughs> fucking mohawk, let me tell you something. <laughs> I know. You know, like, I do not want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I didn't, because I, I remember that guy when I was a kid and I didn't oh, yeah. like him. I, I definitely I, don't. I also think it helps having kids because they keep you young. They keep in the loop on the new stuff and they keep you yeah. keep mm-hmm. your mind open, I think, too. I, I and I, I think that the younger and older generations can can mesh well enough, right? Yeah. Um you know, we've seen it. I remember there's there was evidence of some older generation guys trying to come to the shows, like let's just talk in our mid nineties era. Yeah. Some of them just they couldn't get with it. They felt a little threatened or resentful by, by, or, by, by the new generation of bands and stuff. I mean, right. I mean, you know, they they felt like maybe they weren't being recognized as much as they should have. And they were back yeah. in those younger days. And yeah, you know, well, look, just come hang out. Right. You yeah. Know what I mean, yeah, just just be chill and and get to know people yeah, and you'll find out that you know what you actually are respected as much as anybody else here is at least and people are inspired I mean, by you as well the scene was always great about it is that you can go and hang out and just chill and just yeah. kind of yeah. check it out yeah. you know like you, and, and <laughs> hey there might be a couple of things going on or you know that you're hearing that make you go I don't get that mm-hmm. well yeah you don't but that maybe not supposed to <laughs> exactly that, that doesn't mean it's bad <laughs> right, right? No, 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 right? No. and it, it's not some attack on you and what you represented back you know Years prior, I love that the new bands uh, respect the, the the originators and they give props to them. They wear the t-shirts and they shout it out. And but they're also creating their own 
yeah. legacy and they're creating their own scene and younger kids are coming. And that only helps all of us older bands that are still playing, too. It all, it all helps of, each other, man. I mean, you've probably seen a little bit, too, of the fuck the old heads, right? A bunch of dicks, you know? A bunch <laughs> of, I, I mean, I get it. Yeah. You know, I mean, because there are some of the old heads out there that are kind of st- trying yeah. to remind everybody who, you know. Mm-hmm. You know. I know what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> but no, this this is now. This is this is the, this isn't then. You know what I mean? It's twenty fucking twenty two. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? No like, sh- I mean, look at. I, I think I told you I did the math on this before, right? Um, I turned fifty two <laughs> in February. Set it off just as a sort of a milestone event in my life. Happened twenty eight years ago. Damn. Okay. Twenty eight years. Twenty eight years ago, right? And I'm fifty two. Twenty eight years ago, or forward from today. I will be 80 years old. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. That's so crazy. Do you understand dude. what's what That's I'm saying right there? Crazy, man. <laughs> Fuck, man. <laughs> so insane. It's crazy. We're definitely lucky to have been around during that whole time in New York yeah. and experience all that and travel and play those shows. And I mean, I'm very grateful of those experiences. Um, I think it definitely kept us young. Playing music, it and still it, keeps I us, think it keeps us yeah. thinking young today as best sure. we can, right? Yeah. Right, right, hundred percent. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, you look great, bro. You're looking good. It's crazy. We're all wearing hats. We're all glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, fuck, man. I think we covered a lot of things. Any questions? Yeah. Any more questions for Matt? Um, no, I think that's it. Because this, yeah. we did a part one before, but this, yeah, this, that's right. This one's way better. I mean, this is fucking. Yeah, this is fun. This, this is, is fun, really good. Man. We two hours already. I believe it. I, you know, I, I could sit and, you know, to me, this is like, this is my culture. This is, yeah. you know, you are my people. We are, we are people that we have a bond in ways that not everyone True. can relate to. Right? Yeah, not to say that there aren't other people with other types of experiences and bonds of similar, you know, value and power. But, you know, we're talking about ours right yeah. now. Yeah. And, uh, I I cherish it, man. Me too, I mean, man. It's no it's who I am, right? You know? Yeah, forever be, man. No matter what. Even, yeah. For even how normal you know life can get with maybe owning something or you know driving your kids to school or paying the mortgage or being part of society. Yeah. But still, I still feel like you know the weirdo in society sometimes. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Especially going to the school things and all that <laughs> stuff. I yeah. still have to go to and yeah. Like what do you do? I'm in a band, whatever. Play hardcore, blah blah blah. You know, <laughs> we're still we're still outcasts. We're also adults in society. Hey, look, I you know you got to pay bills. You got to deal with you know the world. Yeah. Uh, but where my heart, and my passion is, I think is you know a little different space than just your average sort of normal dad. Yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of life traveling experiences that a lot of people don't even leave with it, with their towns. You know. But that's the other the thing. I've found that you know. I can. I've made a lot of good friends over the years that are normal dads, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what you find is they got heart and passion and totally and have a lot of good views on things too that I totally relate with. And those are the friendships that really stick. Yeah. Um. And so, you know, uh, you don't have to be hardcore to be cool. Right. right? Not at all. Yeah, I agree. Not at all. Yeah. But I feel like there's something that. We definitely have a different set of values probably that we instill in our children that maybe some yes. people that didn't do have experiences we had. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. There's, and got to be part of these amazing bands have these lyrics that kind of changed our lives and kind of inspired us to be who we are. It's and real. It's mm-hmm. totally real. It's, it's real. something really special that, yeah, it's, it's, it's very special. As big as it gets or as small it gets or it's, it was still a huge impact, you know? Totally. Well, fuck, Excellent. man. I guess we end on that note, right? Yeah, I think it's a good it's a note. Good to and end. then we, we wild card. Where'd that come from? Uh, it was kind of half stigma, half Craig Satari, right? I was, um, you know, I kind of had that real fresh baby face type of look, and you know, uh, ah, the good clean cut kid from Minnesota, and then maybe next thing you know, I'm, you know, slamming a shot of tequila and drinking a beer and. <laughs> thinking maybe someone's going to try to fight us or i you know i don't know not to yeah. say i was a tough guy or anything but i'm just yeah. saying i kind of you know would behave in a way they're like whoa i didn't see that coming from the fresh right. clean kid from the midwest <laughs> right and so yeah he's the wild card we don't know where he's gonna land I you know i love that dude and then uh i mean i still like who did i run into i don't know like it, 
if I run into people from the 90s that I don't see very often, but yeah. when I do, that's how they still refer to me. I love it. It's <laughs> amazing, dude. The wild card. Because I didn't, let me be clear, I did not walk around introducing myself as wild card. <laughs> Everyone told, you know, like Craig and Vinny would mm. say, hey, you know, you know, it's the wild card. Everybody, <laughs> the- we, everybody got nicknames, man. Right, exactly. Fucking, yeah. That's pretty amazing. You're pretty chill in your older age, though. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you got to be. <laughs> otherwise, you know. It, yeah. it complicates your life. If you want to get nutty, mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, maybe you could even justify it based on what the circumstances are, but yeah. guaranteed still, you're, 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 you're risking problems for yeah. you. That just isn't worth it. That it just is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when keeping it real goes, goes wrong, wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's true. <laughs> oh, and one, okay, right, one more thing. You did the intro for that, right? The keeping it real part on the Mad Ball record you were talking in the beginning? I live with my parents, oh, keeping yeah, it yeah, real. Oh, yeah, 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 What album was that? Uh, Hold It Down. Yeah, that yeah. was amazing, dude. Yeah, I'll say this. People assume it was about Rick to life, and it was not. Set the record straight right now. That's right. It was not Word. at all. Okay. Good. You set the record <laughs> good, straight. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Henderson. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here, man. Thank Shout you. Shout out to your three sons, being yeah, so chill in the other room watching Super Connie for two hours. <laughs> Super Troopers. <laughs> They're good boys. They're yeah. good boys. Yeah, we got a beautiful, awesome family, man. Yeah. It's fucking... Thank you. It's pretty, I was telling Moon today, it's like, it's crazy thing about like, if I had been... We're talking about like my mom raised three boys and you're raising three boys. But oh, yeah, that's with, right. With stability and yeah. life and it's like, just cool to see that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Pretty wild, man. It's a good good time. All right. Mad love, Henderson. All right. We out. Peace. Peace. I always ask my guests if they have any regrets. I personally don't have any regrets. Even when it comes to my tattoos, I have the silliest tattoos. Even my ET on my leg, it's still a childhood memory for me, and I love it. I've had tattoos on top of tattoos strictly because I wanted more tattoos. I started getting tattoos when I was 18. I'm 52 now, and I can't stop. I've had lazy treatment before on something on my arm. It's four tattoos on top of each other. And that experience at that place was pretty fast. It was pretty cold. It was in and out. Swipe the credit card. Don't really tell me much. Didn't give me much details or anything was going to happen. So I never went back. So as of most recently, I'm so lucky enough to have had two sessions at Removery Tattoo Removal. My tattoo on my arm that looks like a big black blob is now super light. I've had two sessions. I have a long road ahead of me. None of this stuff happens overnight. You cannot take a tattoo up in one sitting. You have to be patient. And it's painful. They ice you up. It's super fast. To me, it felt like a bunch of rubber bands. But what's more painful than that is looking at something on your body that you think you're stuck with for the rest of your life. That sucks. But now for me, I'm really happy I started this journey. I'm slowly going to get this tattoo removed. I never thought in a million years I have any kind of real estate on my arm. I don't even know what I want, but it's exciting. I'm so honored to announce that One Life, One Chance podcast is now with Removery. I have a code. Use TobyH20 and get $100 off your first session. Call 866-934-4570 or go to removery.com. One of the most experienced tattoo remover companies in the world. Over 600,000 remover treatments done. 100 locations. U.S., Canada, and Australia. State-of-the-art peak away laser technology. Cryotechnology to reduce any discomfort. This is so exciting for me because all I do in these podcasts is talk about tattoos. From day one, if you've been listening to this podcast, we talk about tattoos, talk about getting removed, talk about getting covered up. So this is such a perfect fit for me. Once again, go to removery.com or call 866-934-4570. Use my code TOBYH20 and get $100 off. These guys are located everywhere. Try it out.